Evening. Can everybody take a seat? They can take a seat. We're going to go ahead and start our meeting. I don't. I don't. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome as I call to order the April 2022 meeting of the Skin McCain School Board. Whether you're joining us via our live stream or in the audience, we appreciate your interest in the education of the students of the Skinma County. I ask that you silence all your cell phones at this time. And I remind you that if you wish to speak at either agenda item or at public forum, you must complete a speaker request form found on the table at the rear of the room and bring it forward to Mr. Welly right there at the front table. If this it is this board's practice to pull the items from the consent agenda when someone asks to speak. The consent agenda items include the curriculum and instruction, finance, human resources, and operations. You must submit your speaker form prior to the approval of the consent agenda. This meeting was properly advertised in the Pensacola News Journal on March 23, 2022. Legal notice number 5183615. And before we go to the next part, I want to make sure I got my phone on silent. <laughs> it is a tradition of Scammy County School Board to begin our, our meeting with a invocation or a mo motivational moment followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. This month is District 4, Miss Hightower will lead us. Um, before I get started, there are some seats in the front if people in the back would like to sit down. I know how bad it is. I, I go to church and nobody wants to sit on the front row. <laughs> if you've got a seat next to you, raise your hand, please. feel like I'm at... Anyway, I just wanted to help those that... Um... So if you are able, if you would please stand. Please join me in a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Thank you. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, we'll move to the adoption of the agenda. Mr. Superintendent, are there additions, additions, deletions to your recommended agenda? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We do have a number today, starting with uh, Section 6, proposed additions or revisions to school district rules First reading, item C, delete changes to the Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook for the 2022-2023 school year. Item D, amend changes to the Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook for the 2022-2023 school year. Under section eight, consent curriculum alternative education, Item C, delete amendment to the cooperative agreement with the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice. Under section 15, consent curriculum professional learning. Item A, delete 2021-2022 instructional materials adoption. Item C, amend 2021-2022 instructional materials adoption. Under section 19, consent curriculum other. Item A, add premises use agreement. Under section 24, consent finance purchasing. Item W, add RFP award, learning walks coaching services for principals, <coughs> RFP number 221502. Under section 33, consent operations, food services, delete A, excuse me, item A, delete 2022, exemption from Miss Willie Ann Glenn Act, 595.407 Florida statutes. 
Item B, amend 2022 exemption from Miss Willie Ann Glenn Act 595.407, Florida statutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. State statutes and school board rules require that changes made to the agenda after the publication be based on a finding of good cause determined by the person designated to provide over the meeting and stating in, state in record. Is there any objection from any board member to the additions and deletions? Okay. Yeah. Objection, but I'd like to ask a question. The 2122 instruct, instructional materials, we do it in this year for the coming year, so it's still considered 2020. 20, okay, just. Yes, that is correct. Okay. The adoption was this year, implementation for next year. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have good cause for the changes, Mr. Superintendent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do I have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended for good cause at this meeting? I move the adoption of the amended agenda. Second. I'll second. Discussion? If not, please vote. M Mr. Fetzko? I pressed one over here, so it's that one. There it is. <laughs> motion carries 5-0. Okay, this buttons everywhere. We will now move into the committee and departmental reports and special recognitions. Uh, the first that we got is the PTA presentation, Mr. Superintendent. Did we got a speaker? Mm, okay. Yes, we do. Ms. Kerman. Thank you, Ms. Kerman. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, fellow school board members, superintendent, and staff. ECC PTA held a reflection ceremony March 25th at the Washington High School Auditorium. Over 30 students were recognized for their participation. Thank you, Chairman Adams and Mrs. Hightower for attending and representing the school district. Escambia County Council held our second roundtable of the year. Thank you, Ms. Hightower, for attending and providing your wisdom and support. We touched base with our local PTAs and encouraged them to finish the race. Next week, ECCPTA will be hosting the Student of the Year Awards Ceremony in partnership with Baptist Healthcare. Our ceremony will be held on the 26th at the Washington High School Auditorium. We will be recognizing over, students, over 50 students throughout the county. Thank you, Dr. Angel Bradley, our Student of the Year Chair, for all her hard work behind the scene in organizing this event. Lastly, I would like to announce our projected slate of officers for 2022-2023. For President, Melanie Gamble. First VP, Megan Boone. Secretary, Karen White. Treasurer, Carla Slack. Thank you to our nomination committee for their hard work. We will hold elections on May 12th via Zoom. PTA members must be registered to attend. An invitation will be sent to our members via email and posted on our Facebook page. On behalf of Escambia County Council of PTAs and our local units, I appreciate the opportunity to share our good news. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Did y'all notice that one of our former employees is going to be the president yes. of the council? Good volunteers. <laughs> okay, Mr. Superintendent, stellar employee. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Escambia County School District's Office of Community Involvement is proud to recognize Mr. Cordarius Jones as the stellar employee for the month of April 2022. Mr. Cordarius Jones, aka Mr. Bus Driver, please come forward with your coworkers, family, and friends. Mr. Cordarius Jones is a bus operator with a positive message for students and parents. The inside of Mr. Jones' bus looks like a classroom. Lessons about kindness, history, facts, and the like can be seen affixed to the ceiling of the bus. Cordarius Jones is a funny guy with a big heart, and he uses the experiences he has on the bus to provide comic relief to many 
via his Facebook page, Mr. Bus Driver. <laughs> the comedy he provides gives parents a glimpse of what happens inside the bus on a daily basis. Every post is positive and pokes a little fun at the day-to-day -day life of a school bus operator. Mr. Jones is indeed funny, but he also sheds light on safety concerns our students face each day. He brought his concerns of motorists running bus stop arms to the Escambia County Sheriff's Department earlier this year. As a result, a special neighborhood engagement team was formed. The Sheriff's Department began following school buses to try and catch motorists who endanger the lives of our students by running the bus stop arms. Deputy Stephen Hausman reported that since he began the stop arm crackdown, he has ticketed so many drivers he has lost count. Cordarius Jones is concerned for the totality of student safety, and he demonstrated this upon our return from the COVID-19 shutdown. Mr. Jones used his personal time to develop videos for the transportation department that demonstrate the proper way to disinfect a bus and keep students safe during the pandemic. Mr. Jones is a team player. He covers routes from Century to Warrington and all points in between. If he sees an opportunity to help a fellow bus operator, he does so without prompting. He always has a positive attitude and demonstrates this daily with students, parents, school staff, and fellow co-workers. Mr. Cordarius Jones deserves recognition as the Escambia County Stellar Employee of the Month. Cordarius Jones is stellar because of his excellent work ethic and dedication to the staff and students throughout the Escambia County School District. He exemplifies the pillars of people and service, and it is for these reasons and so many others that he has been selected as our Stellar Employee of the Month of April 2022. He will receive a plaque, pin, and a check for $100 from Members First Credit Union. Thank you and congratulations, Mr. Cordarius Jones. Thank you. Well, speechless. First and foremost, I would like to give glory, honor, and praise to my Lord and Savior for the gift of life. Without putting him first, thank you. Without putting him first, I would not be the man I am today. To my family, thank you for some supporting me in every aspect of life. Thank you for always pushing me to my greatest potential. To my beautiful fiance, thank you for being you. Thank you for being my number one supporter since day one. Thank you for the countless words of encouragement each and every day. Thank you for lifting my spirit when I found myself drained and depressed trying to lift others. <laughs> Being chosen to receive this award means a lot. Knowing the struggles we've all had to overcome these past few years with the extreme shortage in staff, COVID taking a toll on everyday lives and so much more. We've all conquered any challenge that came our way. When I look at this plaque, I won't just read it as employee of the month. What I see is team of the year. It's only right in my heart that I share this with my entire transportation family. To my amazing director, thank you for 
your hard work each and every day. Thank you for always being there for your drivers and assistants, whether we need to talk to you about a problem on our bus or just want to talk to you about something personal in our life. Your door has always been open to us and your willingness to listen and want to help means more than you know. To my route manager, Richard Lopez, thank you for being that supervisor who's serious about his work but can have a good time as well. Thank you for being so caring and understanding of your drivers and assistants. One thing you told me that sticks to me every single day is, Jones, if, I, if, I, <laughs> if I'm ever asking too much of you, please let me know. If you ever need a day where you just need to rest, I understand and we'll have you covered. Just let me know. That shows the level of care you have for us. We greatly appreciate you. To all route managers, Jennifer, Shannon, Kenny, Nicole, Shanetta, and Mitzi, thank you for your hard work each and every day. No matter what, you all get the job done. Before working here, I didn't even know there was a such thing of a manager driving a bus. <laughs> <laughs> you all do it each and every day. Your dedication is greatly appreciated. To our hardworking, dedicated, and awesome safety and training team, garage personnel, clerks, and dispatchers, thank you for your day-to-day -day service and keeping us rolling each and every day. Your role is just as important in the safety of transportating our precious cargo. Special thank you to Deputy Halsam and Sergeant Lee with the Escambia County Sheriff's Office for hearing my call for help and immediately jumping into action in an effort to protect our students while loading and unloading our buses. Also, thank you to Tanner Stewart and the entire WER team for showcasing Mr. B excuse me, <laughs> for showcasing Mr. Bus Driver in such a positive light to the public for giving us a voice. Now, to my fellow drivers and assistants, those of you who are here today and those of you who are still out on the road delivering our cargo, thank you for accepting the challenge each and every day. Thank you for the countless number of laughs and joyful conversations we have every single day on the bus ramp while waiting for our students to release. Thank you for the hard work you all put in. I'm proud to say I belong to the best department in this district. And last but not least, thank you to the little people who made me Mr. Bus Driver. <laughs> <laughs> To the ones who give me a headache at the end of the day, <laughs> but fill my heart with so much joy in the morning. The ones who call me the cool bus driver, the fun bus, the party bus, my students. I love each and every one of you and greatly appreciate your love and support. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Superintendent, the next item you have is a FHSAA Academic Team State Runner-Up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This evening, I'm pleased to welcome Team Escambia, the state runner-up of this year's Commissioner's Academic Challenge. This team of the Escambia County School District students displayed class and character while competing against the state's best and brightest. Having fought their way out of the constellation round to make semifinals and earn a berth in the finals round, they claimed second place by edging out the third place team by two points. Due to COVID, the state academic team tournament was not held in 2020 or 2021, which means that this team was comprised of newcomers to this contest format. This FHSAA sanctioned contest awarded competing team members a medal and the district another trophy for the case. Escambia's winning tradition continues. Please join me in celebrating this year's Team Escambia. And if we could have Jessica Rao and Coach Tristan Harris from Tate High School approach the podium.
Thank you, members of the board and Superintendent Smith. Um, we would like to introduce the team with your permission. Okay. From uh, Pensacola High School, we have Wasim Kabu. <laughs> Colin Gold. <laughs> Roman Bassett. Anna Kennedy is playing for the Lady Tigers softball team right now, but let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> From Tate High School, Abby Krasevich. From Escambia High School, Michael Robbins. And Booker T. Washington High School, we have Christian Hall. And Beatrice Bunnell. Beatrice is at Pensacola Children's Course Practice, so a very well-rounded group we have here. I just want to say a huge thank you to Dr. Smith and to the board, to all of our administrators of these amazing kids and their coaches, many of whom are here tonight. We appreciate your continued support of academic team and what we do. Thank you. Superintendent, you want to come on the podium? Come up here on the up here. Yeah. Yeah. If you bring all of them up. Okay. okay. There you go. So everybody can see them. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations, buddy. Good job. Mr. Superintendent, next item is Commissioner's Business Recognition Award. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are honored and proud to be able to recognize Backpack Project USA as the Escambia County School District's Business Partner of the Year for 2021-2022. In addition to recognizing Backpack Project USA as the district's partner of the year, we are also very proud to be recognizing them as our nominee for the Commissioner's Business Recognition Award. Our district business partners provide support and assistance to schools throughout the district in many ways. This support can be through financial contributions, in-kind donations, volunteer hours, or an expertise advisory role. Additionally, district business partners form relationships that are ongoing throughout the year and typically involve numerous schools. Regular communication, mutual objectives, and specific outcomes are part of these relationships. 
Backpack Project USA began as a project of the Escambia County School District's maintenance department in 2011, when maintenance employees recognized a significant need for children at risk for hunger. The staff felt compelled to help combat childhood hunger in the very schools they worked in every day. While students were being fed while they were at school during the week, the concern grew that many of our food insecure students did not have access to sufficient nutritional food items over the weekend. In 2016, Backpack Project USA filed the necessary paperwork to become a Florida not-for-profit corporation and became a standalone organization. Volunteers from several departments within the Escambia County School District, as well as volunteers from the community, now help facilitate the distribution of food to our students each Friday. What began as a pro program that provided food for the weekend to about 25 students now provides food for the weekend to over 500 students identified as at risk for hunger. A backpack of food consists of eight to 10 items and is provided for the student to take home every Friday. The backpacks contain a healthy balanced menu of food items, including protein, vegetables, fruits, grains, and dairy. Because consistent resources are needed to help raise funds to purchase food and supplies, Backpack Project USA also sponsors an annual family fishing rodeo on Labor Day weekend each year. The Family Fishing Rodeo has become an invaluable opportunity for community outreach and family involvement and serves as the primary fundraising event for Backpack Project USA. The positive student outcomes as a result of the generosity of Project Backpack USA is truly immeasurable. No doubt students perform better academically when their bellies are full and they don't have to worry about having enough food to eat when they are not at school. We have seen improvement in not only academics, but alertness, positive behavior, and more. Backpack Project USA is committed to serving the needs of our at-risk-for-hunger students so that and so many other reasons, we are extremely proud and honored to nominate them as the Escambia County School District's 2022 nominee for the Commissioner's Business Recognition Award. And we'd like to recognize this uh, incredible group. Uh, we're very proud of them as our nominee for the Commissioner's Business Recognition Award. And uh, we'd like to uh, ask to come to the podium the following people. We have the board members, President Greg Gibbs. He is our Director of Maintenance and Custodial Services. We have Vice President Richard Lyons, Maintenance Leaderman. Director of Ops, Tiffany Clark, Energy Manager. and Treasurer Missy Hogan of East Hill Medical Group. I'd also like to uh, announce our employee sharing on the various committees. We have Eddie Flynn from Maintenance, Adam Wisdom from Maintenance, Mitch Mosley from Maintenance, Josh Cassart, Facilities Planning, Dana Snyder, Facilities Planning, Katie Lewis, Transportation, Robert Brown of Maintenance, and Cody Struther of Communications. We recognize them and thank them for all that they do. This truly is a dedicated and remarkable group of people who have driven this initiative and directly impact the food security for our, our students and families over the weekends. Uh, we are just grateful for the uh, exemplary work they've done on this very special project uh, and, and thank you for all that you do. Uh, if our board members could come greet the, the board members, you'd appreciate that.
texture makes it, makes it worse. quite an honor. I wanted to say I've been kind of in the role and with the organization from conception and it's come a long way. It's amazing what a, a small, I'm going to say, seed or thought would be and what it can grow into. Um, but you can't do it by yourself. And uh, with the group, it, it's very good. But I would like to recognize a little something. We've had, we have a lot of volunteers in our group. We have sponsors that sponsor our fishing rodeo, and we have partners. And tonight, I, if some of our those folks are here, and I would definitely like to at least to recognize them. Um, we have uh, our partners. We have Sonny's Barbecue that partners with us, Mana Food Bank. We have Big Game Fishing, which they've been our longest uh, partner, and um, we have the American Heart Association, and then. Um, Levin Pap Antonio Rafferty Law Firm. And so many years ago, I would have never thought that we would have had this type of organization and this type of support, but it just goes to show you what a community involvement does and, and the people that get on board and they do care about the kids, they care about hunger. And for these folks that support us, um, it's a big, it's a really, really big deal. They, they really come out and support us and, and it gives us the drive to continue. But I would like for you guys to stand if you don't mind. I mean, when I called you, I was hoping you'd stand up. But. <laughs> it wouldn't be possible without, without them and the volunteers and our sponsors. And I, I appreciate this honor and uh, the association does, uh, our organization, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Superintendent PBIS Model School Awards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is my honor to present to you the 2020-2021 PBIS MTSS Model School recipients. This year, we have 24 schools that have met the requirements to become a PBIS Model School. It should be noted that we have more Model School Award recipients this year than in any other year in the past. PBIS is the application of evidence-based strategies and systems to assist schools to increase academic performance, increase safety, decrease problem behavior, and establish positive school cultures. This process is a team-based approach that relies on a strong collaboration between families and professionals from a variety of disciplines regardless of the level implemented. We would like to begin by recognizing that this year's Resilience Award is unlike the Model School Awards from years past. In order to receive the Resilience Award status, schools must demonstrate behavior support strategies both in the physical classroom and in the remote classroom. The schools must also demonstrate an overall effectiveness of Tier 1 behavioral data and use this data to develop a plan of action that ensures equitable behavioral outcomes for all students. Escambia County Schools have been recipients of PBIS model stat school status for 11 years. The first year we had two schools. This year, we have 24 schools, which is quite an accomplishment considering our schools met these requirements in the midst of a pandemic facing unprecedented odds. Mrs. Stephanie Hamrick, PBIS District Coordinator, will announce our PBIS model schools for the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, board. The first school we have for today is Bellevue Middle School. We have Principal Tara Palaciano and Assistant Principal Dee Harris.
The second school tonight, we have Beulah Middle School with Principal Marietta McCaskill and PBIS coach James Siegel. Next, we have Blue Angels Elementary School with Assistant, Prin Assistant Principal Michelle Henry Slater and PBIS coach Vanessa Griffin. <laughs> Next, we have Brentwood Elementary School with Principal Jennifer Sewell and PBIS coach Jeremy Malden. Next, we have CAY's Elementary School with Principal Kim Thomas and PBIS coach Emily Riles. <laughs> Next, we have Ernest Ward Middle School with Principal Nancy Gendel Perry and PBIS coach Justin Mills. Next, we have Escambia High School with Principal Frank Murphy and PBIS coach Ryan James. <laughs> Next, we have Ferry Pass Elementary School with Principal Katrina Fig and PBIS coach Jacob Freeman. Next, we have Global Learning Academy with Principal Judy Labounty and PBIS coach Joanna Hayes. <laughs> Next, we have Workman Middle School with Principal Derek Thomas and PBIS coach Lisa Woody. Next, we have Jim Bailey Middle School with Assistant Principal Regina Sanders and PBIS Coach Dr. Julia Britt. <laughs> Next, we have Longleaf Elementary School with Assistant Principal Quinn Evans and PBIS Coach Cecilia Hale. Next, we have Montclair Elementary School with Principal Shauna Person and PBIS Coach Tori Wright. <laughs> Next, we have Myrtle Grove Elementary School with Principal Robin Malloy and PBIS Coach Gina Hoyland. Next, we have Oak Crest Elementary School with Principal Chair uh, with PBIS Chairman John Herber and PBIS Coach Lori Martin. <laughs> Next, we have Pine Forest High School with Principal Deborah Ray and Assistant Principal Emily King. Next, we have Pleasant Grove Elementary School with Principal Nicole Owens Bragg and PBIS coach Aaron Foote. <laughs> 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 
Next, we have Ransom Middle School with assistant principal, Al Marsh, and PBIS coach, Stephanie Wingate. It's gonna be hard to get a group picture. We've gotten so big, Dr. Smith, we should have broken it up in groups. Next, we have Home Elementary School with Principal Terry Fina and PBIS Coach Sharice Tarter. <laughs> Next, we have Sherwood Elementary School with Principal Kristen Danley. And next we have Warrington Elementary School with Principal Tim Rose and PBIS Coach Misty Rawls. <laughs> and we have Warrington Middle School with Principal Denny Wilson and PBIS Coach Amelia Murphy. Next, we have Washington Senior High School with Assistant Principal Sharita Fournay and PBIS Coach Charlotte Watts. And last, but definitely not least, we have West Pensacola Elementary School with Principal Christine Baker and PBIS Coach Brittany Linton. That completes our Resilience Awards for PBIS 2020-2021. Yeah. yeah, we'll get out of the way. Yeah, some up here. Okay, we're going to stack y'all up on the we're stage. We're going to ask y'all to come back. Stage. Some in the front and some up top. I'm up on the stage, some down bottom. Just <laughs> squeeze in. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Tell people come up the stage. Thank you, sir. This is charming. Uh -huh. I'll bring that to you like that. Just don't know how much I want it to. <laughs> Somebody should unfurl one of the signs. Bigger stage. <laughs> Dr. Smith, can one of them open up the, like maybe somebody in the front open up one of the banners so people can see what the, it says? You better get up here with us. Come on. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to say it. I'll go sweet chances. see you one day. I know you get tired of Paul.
trying to keep it from having feedback. Am I right? Yes, sir. I said the banner was like so realistic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I kept forgetting it. Or in the wellness or the flu or the flu ring. Yes. We're getting more seats open, so those standing up got plenty of room to sit down now. Okay, Mr. Superintendent, we have the Choose Wellness Challenge winners. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Director of Risk Management and Benefits, Mr. Kevin Windham, and Coordinator of Benefits and Employee Wellness, Mr. Pat Palmer, please approach the podium. Each year, the district challenges employees to participate in the Choose Wellness Challenge. The challenge is to see which school or major department can achieve the highest percentage of employee <coughs> participation and the highest percentage of improvement from one period to the next in the Choose Wellness Challenge. Each site-based administrator and wellness coordinator was tasked with motivating employees to complete, to complete all four steps of the health screening program. The locations with the highest achievement are recognized annually, including a financial incentive reward to be used for wellness initiatives at each location. Awards are paid from wellness dollars, so no taxpayer dollars are used. The decision to create a district wellness center and program was made to promote employee wellness because a healthy workforce equates to lower medical costs and lost work hours which in turn creates a more productive and higher achieving workforce and higher student achievement. It is my pleasure to announce the following awards. For the 2020-2021 Superintendent's Wellness Challenge, overall winner is Molino Park Elementary School at 67.7%. We're gonna do that. By the way, this is the second year in a row that they have won this wellness challenge. By the way, that was a $1,000 check in case uh, you weren't able to see the, the numbers. The next award goes to the most improved. The most improved winner this year is West Pensacola Elementary School with an increased participation of 18.3%. Will representatives from West Pensacola Elementary School please come forward to receive your plaque in a $500 check.
In addition to creating a healthy competition between schools and major departments at each level, awards of $250 each are awarded at this time to the highest percentage participation at each school or major departmental level. As your school or department is announced, please come up to receive your award and be congratulated by the school board. The highest percentage participation at the middle school level goes to Ferry Pass Middle School at 43.3%. The highest percentage participation at the high school level goes to West Florida High School of Advanced Technology this year at 43.6%. And our final group, the highest, part, uh, highest percentage participation at the major department level goes to the Alternative Education Department at 60.2%. Congratulations to all schools and departments for your success. And I want to just special thanks to Kevin Windham and Pat Palmer for all that they do on this initiative. We thank them very much. Okay, next we have the resolution to name the JM Tate High School Gymnasium Multi-Purpose Room, the Stan Telovich Multi-Purpose Room. Teletovich. Thank you, Teletovich. <laughs> All right, Mr. Superintendent, if you Thank read you. the motion, the resolution. There is a resolution. Yeah, he's going to read it. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, if you let him. Uh, Mr. Teletovich and family and any uh, school 
uh, family, feel free to approach the podium. Excellent. Resolution. Whereas the School Advisory Council of J.M. Tate High School alumni, former faculty and staff and colleagues respectfully request to name the J.M. Tate High School Gymnasium multi-purpose room, the Stan Teletovich multi-purpose room in honor of Stan Teletovich. And whereas Stan Teletovich started the wrestling program at Booker T. Washington High School in 1971 and served as head coach from 1971 to 1975. Stan Teletovich also started the wrestling program at J.M. Tate High School in 1987 and served as head coach from 1987 to 2003. He also served as a wrestling coach at Tate High School from 2006 to 2012 and from 2018 to present, totaling 26 years of coaching at Tate High School. During those years, he coached 25 state qualifiers, three of which were state place finishers and a two-time state runner-up. And whereas Stan Teletovich spent 31 years as a teacher for the Escambia County School District, he began his teaching career at Booker T. Washington High School in 1971 until 1975, Blunt Middle School from 1975 to 1978, Longleaf Elementary from 1978 to 1981, Escambia High School from 1981 to 1982, then J.M. Tate High School from 1982 to 2002. And whereas Stan Teletovich has dedicated his life and career to education and athletics, even post-retirement, he has instilled the importance of dedication, character, good sportsmanship, and discipline in his students and the athletes he has coached. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the school board of Escambia County, Florida, find the above recitals to be true and correct and incorporate them herein by reference the Escambia County School Board hereby expresses its support for this resolution and, and encourages the recognition of the Stan Teletovich multi-purpose room in honor of Stan Teletovich for his service and contributions to the J.M. Tate High School and the surrounding community. This resolution shall take effect immediately upon its adoption by the Escambia County School Board. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution to be spread upon the minutes of the regular meeting of the said school board and that a copy be tendered to the administration of J.M. Tate High School and Stan Teletovich, adopted this 19th day of April 2022. Do we have a motion to adopt the resolution? I would like to make a motion to adopt this resolution. Second? I'd like to second the, re the resolution. Discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5 0. Congratulations. <laughs> so we try to keep uh, this a secret. That's probably why he's a little speechless. But um, be on his behalf, um, we can't thank you enough. The Teletovich family, every rest, the hundreds of Tate wrestling alumni, the whole Aggie family, everyone that was involved, James Kite, Miss Touchstone, Coach Panuki. This is more than you, we, could, we could ever thank you for. This is amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> oh. 
We will now begin public forum. The purpose of the public forum is to give members of the public the opportunity to address the school board on any matter of concern, particularly regarding education and administration of our schools. In this setting, as we as school board members are not compelled to answer questions or respond to you, or, and normally will not engage in a back and forth dialogue in this venue. However, your concerns will be noted by this board and the superintendent for a response. As always, we invite you to contact any one of us by phone or email for the follow-up. A list of our meeting times and locations is posted in the Scammy County School District website. The speakers must adhere to the guidelines printed on the back of the speaker form. On the form, please be sure to indicate whether your intention to speak at the public forum or to a specific item on tonight's agendas. Please direct your comments to the chair. You're expected to be respectful to, in your address to the board. You're also asked to use titles and not individual names. Personal attacks against school board members, superintendent staff, and employees will not be tolerated. If you fail, fail to follow these guidelines, you'll be warned by the chair and subject to removal if violations continue. Each speaker will be allowed three minutes. Ms. Odom will serve as parliamentarian. Ms. Buswell is our timekeeper, and we will start the timer with your opening remarks. The buzzer will sign sound when your time has elapsed. When the timer sounds, please bring your comments to close as quickly as possible. And then our first speaker is Candace Harrison. Good afternoon. I'm here to represent parents at Jim Allen Elementary School. Um, I was denied my right on a fourth grade field trip for a student who has serious allergies. Um, our superintendent is aware of this issue. Um, they, I have been talking with Dr. Smith um, back and forth through email and by phone. Um, they keep informing him that they have trained staff. Trained staff is unacceptable. When you have a child with a life-threatening illness and me being told I could wait on the side of Jefferson Street for my child's field trip. If they needed me to administer CPR and or epinephrine, they would come get me. That would be too late. Um, that is unacceptable. Um, I would ask that the board, could, board consider implementing a program or something to train our staff in CPR and or epinephrine. Um, being shown the day of the field trip is what I was told by our school. Um, how to use an epinephrine pen is unacceptable. Our teachers, they need training. Um, we have multiple children with allergies in our school system. It's not just our school that need training. Um, I'm working with several organizations trying to see if we can get a grant for our school board. Um, I am very advocate. I will not lose my one and only child to our school board um, and our school system. Um, it's just unacceptable. Um, according to the, uh, the statutes in our program, they did not have our field trip completely uh, form right. It did not state a time of leaving, a time returning, or a time that our students will eat lunch. Um, I asked for a copy of this field trip form. It was denied. They do not have them. They tore them up. Florida statute states that they need to keep them to the end of the school year. Um, also, I have asked for a copy of my child's health plan, which has miraculously disappeared since this field trip. They cannot find it. No explanation. Oh, uh, we'll have you sign a new one stating starting in April. I have not signed one yet because they can't find my last one to update my child's epinephrine that is sitting at the school. Um, I have asked what the ratio was for this field trip. It is stated in our school board policy, 10 to 1. We had 22 kids to one teacher, no other school staff. Unacceptable. How are they going to perform CPR and or call 911 or an epinephrine? At that point, my child would have been dead if he needed it and or any other child. It is unacceptable. I would ask that you consider putting a policy in place and getting our teachers and our staff CPR trained and certified. As our school board bus drivers and our aides have to be trained in CPR and certified, so should our teachers. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Lawrence Wins. I hope I got that last name right. I'm trying to say it again. 
Winder, okay. I was trying to read your cursive. <laughs> Thank you for seeing that. Right, um, my concern today is that I wanted uh, to ask the board, are there any alternative methods to consider uh, since the pandemic to help our at-risk troubled students uh, that are actually getting put into places like Camelot and, and, and other places? Is there anything that, that's in place now to help those students? And if not, can, uh, can we start providing mental health and wellness uh, alternative um, therapies to find out why these students are acting the way that they are? And that's, that's all I wanted to ask the extra board today. Are there anything in place for, for uh, mental health and wellness for our students? The pandemic took a lot out of, out of adults. It took a lot out of our students. Um, I'm an educator, I'm a pastor, uh, administrator, so I, I'm actually teaching not in the K-12 now, uh, but I, I do, as a pastor, I do uh, mentor a lot of these students and, and I also go back and help them with homework, help them with, with so forth. Um, and I think that I think this is this is really needed because of um, what they went through, what we all went through with the, this pandemic. Superintendent's listening to your concerns. I don't know if he wants to comment now or reply back later. So, yes, we can have uh, contact with you, uh, Mr. Marcani, if you don't mind just touching base. Okay. There are. Um, some efforts that have been taking place in our schools. Uh, the school you're re referring to is a little unique in that it's in the setup of our organization, but uh, Mr. Marcanio can provide some contact and resource to get into the, some of those specific details. Okay, all right, thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Sir. Uh, next speaker, Maurice Moody. Good evening. I'm here to say a few words about Lincoln Park Elementary and the assistant principal, Dr. Moody, who was not advanced in the principalship process, uh, which is disheartening and um, very disturbing. Uh, Dr. Moody is a person who is immensely talented, intelligent, and extremely confident in her skills and abilities. She has a sterling reputation in the community and is widely known for her probity and fairness. Her educational attainment is truly impressive. And as you are keenly aware, Dr. Smith, to earn a doctorate, one must be disciplined, organized, goal-oriented, and industrious. These words aptly describe Dr. Moody. As a matter of fact, Dr. Moody earned a bachelor's, master's, specialist, doctorate. So someone with these credentials is not qualified. Someone who has worked as an administrator for over 20 years is not qualified. Someone who has worked as an assistant principal, principal, even serving as the principal of two schools at one time is not qualified. What alternative world are we living in? This feels like a science fiction TV movie or show a la The Outer Limits, The Twilight Zone. I'm dating myself. Fairness and meritocracy would dictate that Dr. Moody should assume principalship at Lincoln Park Elementary. Spent the past year as the assistant principal there. She has over 20 years of administrative experience and her credentials are second to none. So the question is why? If the system here were fair in Escambia County, we would not be here tonight. I would not be here tonight. If Dr. Moody were someone who only had five years of administrative experience and a, a master's only, then we could understand the decision. But for someone who is as accomplished and talented as she, this smells to high heaven. 
So board, we continue to fight as we have low these many centuries and pray for the day when all will be treated fairly, notwithstanding hue, nationality, creed, or religion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Jerry McIntosh. <coughs> Jerry McIntosh. I hope I got that right. Everybody's doing their cursive little signature on that print part. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, school board. I'm here uh, in uh, support also of Dr. Moody, who has uh, proven herself over and over again. Uh, black teachers are less likely to be promoted to principalship roles, <clears throat> and it takes longer for promotion when compared to um, their counterparts. On average, black teachers are waiting almost five to 15 years to be promoted and are nearly 20% less likely to achieve the position. Statistical, black teachers are not commonly found among top leaders in school districts, including black women, professional working in colleges and universities. Black teachers, no matter her qualification, are assigned to roles thought as a better fit role, such as assistant principal, curriculum coordinator, teacher, uh, teachers on special assignment and other titles. I'm here today representing Move for Change and Lincoln Park Homeowners Association in support of Dr. Patrice Moody being assigned to principal, the principal at Lincoln Park Elementary School. She has a PhD, has over 24 years of successful administration experience. 14 of those years serving as a highly effective school-based principal. 1988 to 2005 elementary assistant principal at Scenic Height. 2005-2010 school principal Macmillan Pre-K and Sydney Nelson. 2010-2019 continued her role as principal of Macmillan Center. 2019-21 elementary assistant principal at A.K. Souter. 2021 present, present assistant principal at Lincoln Park. As of now, she is not being considered as a candidate for the Lincoln Park principalship according to the interview committee because she did not so-called do well answering the six questions presented to the, her, the, her the interview. Move for Change is asking for a copy of those six questions as well as an explanation of the process of elimination. Too many times, black women and men accomplishment are often devalued and opportunity confined. Move for Change has also been informed that there are 31 African Americans in administrative position. We are requesting documentations of name, schools, and position for verification. We also request an information regarding a principal pool, what is, what, it, what is the purpose and what is required to attend. Patterns, other issues of concern, pattern of demotion of African-American principal, the lack of support and respect toward African-American educators, the lack of diversity within the senior Thank staff. Thank you, sir. Um, it's really, um, Gave me her time as well. <laughs> I, we don't have it, do we? Well, we have to let her know that it's written. Okay. Okay, so you're donating your time. Is get, what was Linda, it? Gully? Lindy Gully. Linda Gully. Gully. Hold on. Let me get this straight before we go any farther. Number 18. Thank you. That'll get me there quicker. Okay, sir, you got additional three minutes. Move for Change has addressed these same issues years ago, and yet it's, it's still continuing. We must become aware of our unconscious and conscious bias and do what is right and just for all who aspire for leadership roles in the Escambia County School District. We believe that Dr. Moody would be compassionate and understanding and can relate better to those children in that community who often have 
other various issues that need to be addressed. We, as Move for Change and the Homeowners Association, want Dr. Moody as the principal at that school. Dr. Prin uh, Dr. Uh, Moody have proven herself over and over and over again, as so many others have. So we're asking that she be become the next principal of Lincoln Park Elementary School. Thanks, sir. Mr. Chair, might I ask the, the counselor a question? Okay. Uh, Ms. Odom, uh, he just requested several documents. Is that considered a public records request at this point? Or does he need to do something? Uh, we just certainly treat it as such. And what I would suggest is since we have his contact information, if um, th there's no format in which we can require that a public records request be made. Yeah. But I do think that since the request has been made, probably the best way to, to do it would be to make note of it uh, and then have Ms. Dwelly go through the customary process of assigning it a number um, and then handling it through the Thank you. ordinary process. Thank you, Ms. Hightower. Uh, next speaker, Dr. Moody. Good evening, Chairman, school board members, and Superintendent Dr. Smith. I'm Dr. Patrice Moody, the assistant principal at Lincoln Park Elementary. Oftentimes, as an employee of the Escambia County School District, could you I, could you move the mic a little closer to you? I'm sorry. Sure. There you go. Oftentimes, as an employee of the Escambia County School District, I hear fellow colleagues say, "School A needs this. School B needs this. School C needs this." And when I hear that introductory statement, I personally begin to quantify and say, "How do you know?" I've been a site-based administrator at Lincoln Park for 287 days which is equivalent to 6,888 hours, which is also equivalent to 413,280 minutes. If you're not a parent at Lincoln Park Elementary School, if you do not reside in District 3, if you're not employed at Lincoln Park Elementary School, if you're not a volunteer, if you do not know my 247 students, then my question is, do you know what Lincoln Park Elementary needs? Or do you believe or think you know what Lincoln Park Elementary needs? We know what Lincoln Park Elementary School needs. When I was assigned to Lincoln Park in July of 2021, Lincoln Park had earned the school grade of an F. We are now projected to earn the school grade of a C. On March the 10th of 2022, Ms. Hightower sent an email to district employees entitled, Wishing You a Restful Spring Break. Included in this email was an anonymous poem entitled, It Matters to This One, which unbeknownst to her is one of my treasured jewels. I'm going to share the first and last stanza of that poem. As I walk along the seashore, this young boy greeted me. He was tossing stranded starfish back into the deep blue sea. I said, tell me why you bother, why you waste your time this way. There's a million stranded starfish does it matter anyway? And she said, it matters to this one. He deserves a chance to grow. It matters to this one. I can't save them all, I know. But it matters to this one. I'll tell him he can be all he can be. It matters to this one, and it matters to me. Lincoln Park Elementary School does not need a period of transition. It needs consistency. Quantitatively speaking, Lincoln Park Elementary School needs the person standing before you because it matters to this one. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Bernice Wilson. Y'all hear that? Hamilton. her time. She's yielding her time. To Mr. T T Hamilton? Yeah. Okay, what number is he? Have, have you completed a form, sir? I completed it, but I still. I still okay, there it is. You didn't complete the form for you? He, he's got it there. Okay. okay. I need to give it to someone. You, yes, right there. Do what, ma'am?
Parliamentarian? Customarily, they're taken in the order in which they are turned in. Okay, and, and we'll so put it to just submitted his form. Okay. We'll get you, sir. <laughs> oh, okay. All okay. right. All right. And she'll she'll bring that form around to me, so I'll have it with this one. Okay, so okay. you can come back up? Yeah, come back up. Okay. Yeah. Okay, next one's Barbara Mitchell. Good evening. Hi. This is new. Uh, I'm in honor of, God, I'm going to get emotional, of uh, being a volunteer for Lincoln Park. And it was all through uh, Dr. Pat Moody that when she approached me and called me and said, do you know of anybody that would like to be a volunteer? And I said, you've got her. And so uh, I don't live nearby. My church, United Ensley um, Methodist Church, helps partner with Lincoln Park for their other needs. And through that, I got to know Dr. Pat. And, and as a volunteer there at the school, I have seen, it's not an I. It's a we, it's a team effort that she bands everybody together and just can motivate the, the staff of the administration office to the teachers, uh, uh, everybody, all the way down to the custodian. And I've just seen, I would just hate to see not getting that opportunity to take over as principal when I've seen what in the last year and a half, what she's implemented, different programs, and how the, the kids just adore her. So, and I want to stick around too. So, thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, we got somebody else donating minutes. Is Stephanie Sawyer in? I just want to confirm you're here. Okay. Uh, she'll be de devoting uh, minutes to Mr. Ruth. You'll have six minutes, sir. Yes, right now. Good evening to our board and also to Dr. Smith and also those in attendance. I appreciate the opportunity to go ahead and speak in front of you. Last Thursday, I wish I could have been participating in the discussion that you invited me to. Um, Mr. Chairman, however, at that time, I was overseas training our allies, although I did send an email asking if you wanted me to participate via Google Meet uh, twice. I know I didn't receive anything back, which is a reason why I'll go ahead and address uh, tonight. Anyway, our Director of Professional Learning, he did go over some items which I will address later in this brief. But what I want to do right now initially, before I go over, do a brief synopsis on what I went over last time, is provide you some data as where Flight Adventure Deck stood, um, both shortly after I took over and, also, and prior to. Now, in 2011 to 2012, they had 82 slots. Since then, their average has been 55.4, whereas Santa Rosa County, their average has been 65. And the reason why I'm doing this is to go over what can be done and, again, to provide recommendations so that Flight Adventure Deck can get to a very high level, which as you know right now, they do need some help. And remember, last time I briefed y'all, I said, they need some help, Dr. Smith, they need your help so that they can get to a high level. That was my intention. Now, before, for the last three years, before COVID, they had 49, 53, and 51 each year. Santa Rosa had 63, 76, and 78. When they had the shooting in 2019 and 2020, they had, uh, um, Scambia County had 31 at that point, and at that point in time, Santa Rosa had 58, but we couldn't finish the year. Now, in 2020 to 2021, there are absolutely no field trips at all. Scambia County said no field trips, and NES Pensacola said no field trips at all, and no one could go into the museum. The first year for field trips was this year, post-COVID, 2021 to 2022. Now, as you know, it dropped to 13. I had briefed 30, so I apologize they didn't have that correct. As I mentioned last month, Santa Rosa County has the exact same issues as we do. You'll see in the Pensacola News Journal and also WRTV that they also have a bus driver shortage. 
They also have a teacher shortage and also a substitute short teacher shortage, yet they've gone from 83, actually 84 of 83 slots after scheduling back in May, to 87 of 83 back in September when East Bay opened, and then now today 94 of uh, 83 slots. <laughs> Brief recap on the uh, recommendations. I encourage Dr. Smith, that you and the school board and all the principals go on a tour of the Flight Adventure deck like you did with Starbase. You saw the effects that had on Starbase in which I'm going to assume that just about every day is maxed out between when they started March 2nd through today. That certainly works. And as I mentioned before, San Rosa followed, uh, followed that uh, concept. The bus transportation, I mentioned about the shortage yet Santa Rosa does, their students are on deck 3.5 to 4 hours. Ours, I would recommend that y'all go take a tour and see what San Rosa accomplishes during their uh, field trip and also Escambia County. What it amounts to now is about 15 minutes per rotation, which means they're actually there for, uh, for about one hour. I ask that you trust but verify and go and take a look. Now, the bus transportation, Starbase said grants, so I recommend that let's look for grants for the Flight Adventure Deck. I'm sure that the uh, same organization would be willing to increase their allocation, and we're talking around 83 slots. If it can't be filled by, by the uh, current transportation department, get grants like you did for Starbase. Um, I also mentioned funding, how Escambia County School District pays for half the bus. Santa Rosa pays for the entire bus and also two subs. Right now, the way how this situation is, it is not sustainable, in my opinion. The ceiling is about 55.4, even if now we had pre-COVID pre hours, okay, as far as that transportation. What I now wanna brief, though, are some items that were briefed last Thursday, because there were some items which were inaccurate. As far as Ernest Ward, no impact as far as the number of field trips. Reason why I say that is because before I got there, they were not going on field trips to Flight Adventure Deck. I got there in 2018 and 2019. So there was, they had no quotas to begin with, so the current schedule did not affect them. Another, another thing that was mentioned as far as what event, affected Flight Adventure Deck was Hurricane Sally. It had absolutely no impact on the number of field trips at Flight Adventure Deck. Reason why was because it occurred in 2020, September 2020, and, there were and that was uh, post-COVID, and there were absolutely no field trips at all from uh, the Escambia County School District, and none at ANS Pensacola. Another one, as far as teacher resignations, I did a name check on all the teachers, both prior to me leaving on uh, November 5th, and also current day, and as far as those who were scheduled to go this year, those teachers are still on staff. So I know when it came to teacher resignations, as far as those on staff, it didn't affect that piece. And I will say that uh, for the uh, three department chairs that uh, did schedule field trips for Flight Adventure Deck, all of them are still at the uh, district. Another item was mentioned that the 30 minutes were uh, cut. It's actually anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour 15. The evidence before I left, you know, me and also my colleague from Santa Rosa, we made schedules for the entire year for every single school, every single teacher. And we even said thank you, we sir. went over the amount. Thank you, sir. But thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker, and I'm going to try to see if I get the name right. It's Rodney Joris. I get Jones. Okay, <laughs> trying to read some of y'all's writing. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> um, good evening, board. Uh, thank you, first of all, for giving us this opportunity. Um, my name is Rodney Jones. I'm the president of Movement for Change, social justice, civil rights organization. I am here to stand in solidarity with Dr. Patrice Moody in her efforts to become the next principal at Lincoln Park. Um, but first, I have a couple of issues. Um, the first issue is in association with the slow matriculation process of African Americans who are already in the administrative field in Excambia County. Um, a statement was issued last week, April the 14th, 2022, that stated that Excambia County School District had 31 African American people who were in the administrative level. However, I pulled data from public records that shows in 2015, 2016, you had 31 African Americans in the administrative field. So either there's a, this grand egregious process taking place, or there's a tremendous amount of oversight of African Americans when it comes to the promotional field. 
while in the administrative, at the administrative level. Secondly, it's the process. Um, we found out what type of process it is. When you com create a committee, you put that committee together, and that committee then makes the decision whether or not a person moves up or down in the administrative field where they are currently. So it begs the question, where's the oversight for that particular committee? Because these individuals who are in the committee could have a quote unquote leader, someone who's influential, who's a part of that committee, who can steer that particular committee to say yay or nay, based on individuals who might want to be in the good graces of that particular influencer. So uh, I would like to know where's the oversight for that particular committee? And is it the fact that African Americans just can't make the cut? I'm confused on that part. Lastly, I, I do again want to say um, we are here to stand in solidarity with Dr. Patrice Moody. We think she has the educational credentials, she has the experience necessary, and she's put the time in. And for her to be looked over for individuals or at least pushed out of the process while others are pushed up in the process who have less than she has when it comes to the experience and the educational credentials that she has. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Nancy Pollard. Dollar? Okay. Dollar? <laughs> Hello, um, Mr. Chairman. I am a parent of a, of a Pensacola High School IB student, and during the April 14th workshop meeting, I passionately shared my son's experience in which he was exercised his right to provide input on school policy through submitting a petition with over 220 signatories. He requested a formal response from the school administration to the to the student signatories, the parent community, and the student body as a whole. But instead of a formal response, he was pulled out of class and escorted by the IB coordinator to meet with two sworn Pensacola police officers, who were the school resource officers, who ultimately outlined what was wrong in his petition. As parents, we immediately sent an email about this inappropriate meeting to and copied the superintendent's office and we believe that his advocacy was mishandled, was an intimidation tactic, and that we had the right to be informed of the planned meeting. This situation shut down any further communication with the student signatories who exercised their right to provide input and ultimately led to a series of retaliatory events intended to hinder my son's academic future. He went through his experience, and when he went through it, it was clear that there were some negative prejudice towards students who are action-oriented and gifted, rather than nurtured and developed as change makers in our community. The situation has perpetuated a climate of fear of retaliation among such student leaders to raise concerns about local school policies and when they are treated unfairly by the local administration. So this feeling among school, the school community is just not right. And I do not want what happened to our family to ever happen to anyone else. Our situation could happen to any child in the district who is willing to share a student voice on behalf of others. Thus, I submitted recommendations for consideration as what I consider change maker effort, ed edits. And so as board members, you're the only ones with the power to request the inclusion of further edits to this version advertised for public comment. Further, I ask that while you review the Rights and Responsibilities Handbook, that you look at it again through the lens of a student and a parent who desires student success and looks at this handbook for clarity when experiencing challenges with the school system. In the spirit of community engagement, I hope that you listen to students and show them that the district will be responsive and not shut them down like the school did to my son and the petition signatories. I also ask that you expect the district schools to honor the right of students to provide input on school-wide policies through a well-advertised, open, and collaborative amendment process. Thank, Thank you.
Next speaker, Laura Hobbs. Good evening, board members, superintendent. Um, I work at Lincoln Park Elementary, surprise. Um, <laughs> it has been our pleasure this year to get to know better Dr. Moody. She came in last year and worked with us some when our principal had to be out and she just made such a great impression on us and we were delighted when we came back at the beginning of this school year and found her as our new assistant principal. Throughout this year she has, uh, she has been such an engaging and thoughtful person. She walks the halls all the time, fixing problems here and there, um, communicating with the staff, talking to the children, and forging relationships with families and each of us, from little kindergartners up to us. She started a wellness initiative at Lincoln Park. It's been going quite successfully. Um, the first one that we've had that has went successfully. And I just wanna say that who leads you matters. We cannot afford at our school, we have our own unique strengths and challenges. And we are a small school with a very involved community base. We know our families, we know our children, and we need someone who knows us. It matters who leads us. Just anybody will not do there. We need to hit the ground running when we come back. Well, when we come back. Um, we don't have time for someone to have to learn what we do and why we do it and who we do it for. If I had the vote, I would put her in there immediately. She is the person for the job, and she has been there all year learning us, learning all of the things that, um, that our principal can, uh, has been able to train her in to show her why we do what we do for our children and our families. And the fact that we've had this kind of community input as far as this, as far as this goes, just shows you, I'm sorry, I'm emotional, just shows you the high regard that this community and the teachers and, well, and the staff all feel for, the, for Dr. Moody. We want her as our principal. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, our next speaker is Darzale Warren. A little taller than that. Yes. Okay. Good evening to the chair, Dr. Smith, and the remainder of the board. I did not do a resolution because I was a little behind my timeline, but next month on Tuesday, May 3rd, we will be celebrating National Teacher Day. Just a little history of its origin, Eleanor Roosevelt persuaded Congress to proclaim a National Teacher's Day in 1953. National Teacher's Day was celebrated on March 7th until 1984 when it was moved to May. The National PTA managed to get the entire first week of May named Te Teacher Appreciation Week. A year later, the National Education Association established that the first Tuesday of the week would be National Teacher Appreciation Day. This annual celebration recognizes the importance of the job that our hardworking teachers do daily. At times when it seems that they are not appreciated, by some, they continue working endless hours and putting forth that extra effort to ensure students reach their full potential while also preparing them to further their education and enter the workforce. They play an essential role in the lives of students and the work that they do is 
are and the work that they are doing is greatly appreciated. On behalf of the Escambia Education Association, I would like to say thank you to all the hard work working teachers in Escambia County for what you do every day in the lives of our students. And I hope you guys will show them your appreciation at the table soon. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, the next speaker is Autumn Sawyer. Good evening, board. I'm a junior in the IB program at Pensacola High School, and I would like to bring to your attention the oppression of students' rights in the proposed edition of Article AA at the bottom of page 67 of the 2022-2023 Rights and Responsibilities Handbook. The article proposes that all, quote, demonstrations, petitions which interfere with the orderly process of the school environment, end quote, are punishable with up to five days of in-school suspension. Public school students possess a range of free expression rights under the First Amendment. Public school officials are represented as U.S. government actors. As such, must act in accordance with the U.S. Bill of Rights. I understand that to some extent, school officials can regulate these freedoms by prohibiting speech that disrupts the classroom. However, these concerns are already covered in other proposed articles of the new R&R Handbook. Please refer to level one offenses of classroom disruption under Article C on page 62, level two offenses under Article E on page 65, and level three offenses under Article E on page 69. These proposed articles demonstrate the same function, to stop disorderly conduct in the classroom. But Article AA steps further into limiting the rights of students to petition and protest to unreasonable extent. The Supreme Court clarified this right in the 1969 case of Tinker v. Des Moines that public school students do not lose their First Amendment rights, quote, at the schoolhouse gate, end quote. In addition, the 1943 case of West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett ruled that, quote, no official, higher petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics or other matters of opinion, end quote. In 2011, the Supreme Court stated in Borough of Daria versus Garninelli that, quote, both speech and petition are integral to the democratic process. The right to petition allows citizens to express their ideas, hopes, and concerns to their government and their elected representatives, whereas the right to speak fosters the public exchange of ideas that is integral to the deliberative democracy, end quote. If the law, time and time again, has argued for the safeguarding of the First Amendment rights as students, why should we not be able to protest or petition peacefully? We, as a student body, as young adults learning our way in the world, as people, please ask you to remove the proposed Article AA on the bottom of page 67 of the 2022-2023 Rights and Responsibilities Handbook. Thank you. Next speaker, Roman Bassett. Or what number? So wait, she's she's looking for me, huh? Sixteen. Okay. Okay. All right. So it's six minutes for Colin Gold. Sorry, Patty, but there's a lot of different numbers here. Okay. Good evening, school board members, superintendent, and staff. You have met me already as a member of the Escambia County academic team, but now I come to you as a student in the Escambia County School District. I am thankful for the board's tireless efforts in ensuring student safety and cultivating a productive learning environment. However, the text that is found in Article AA worries me, both as a student of history and a student of civics, due to the implications that are present within it its language. Quote, Demonstrations, petitions, possession, and slash or distribution of unauthorized publications, unquote, are among the listed activities that, if disrupted the orderly environment, could be punished with up to five days of in-school suspension. As a member of my high school student government, I can assure you that getting authorization for anything for the student body can be arduous and Byzantine. Many of my contemporaries will discuss the potential complications that arise from this language, but I would like to focus on the spirit of the text. What is the purpose of learning about the rights fought for by previous generations if we are unable to exercise them now? Discipline can and will be given through the appropriate channels, regardless of if this amendment is passed, but the constitutional rights of the students of this county will be challenged. 
As a senior planning to attend Georgia Tech in the fall, I don't have to worry about any of this. Yet, this year I've been told countless times that I serve as a role model for the underclassmen below me. What example would I be setting by choosing to be silent about an issue that could choose to silence me? As a proud American citizen and student of the Escambia County School District, I call upon the board to carefully consider the negative implications that could arise from Article AA in the 2022-23 Rights and Responsibilities Handbook and the responsibility to respect the rights of students in Escambia County. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, Tristan Martinez. Mr. Chairman, I am Tristan Martinez, and I'm a student at Pensacola High School in the IB program. But I come before you today not as a PHS Tiger or as an IB student, but rather as a student of our beloved county. And I'm here to speak against Article AA at the bottom of page 67 on the proposed 2022 to 2023 Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook. The contents of which are as follows. Demonstrations, petitions, possessions, and or distribution of unauthorized publications or misuse of electronic messages or computers which interfere with the orderly process of the school environment, a school function, or an extracurricular slash co-curricular activity will be classified as a level two infraction. Now, of course, walkouts and other forms of protests that disrupt the day-to-day -day functioning of the school should be banned. But the addition of this article does not do any more to prevent such disruptive behaviors. That job is already well delivered by other articles. Uh, the, for example, the level one offenses of articles C, J, L, and M, the level two art offenses of articles E and N, as well as the level three offenses of articles E and R already cover all points mentioned in this article. In fact, most have almost the exact same wording. The only difference is that they do not mention the constitutional rights of students directly. Article AA's only addition is that it can limit the First Amendment rights of peaceable assembly and free petition to students rights that students indisputably have at schools. Best put by Justice Fortas in the 1969 decision, Tinker versus Des Moines, students do not, quote, shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. On top of this, limiting such rights discourages these young and impressionable students from being involved in politics and growing up to be local leaders. This is all possible because the wording of the article is incredibly vague. Nowhere in the 2023 Rights and Responsibilities Handbook is the terms orderly process of the school environment, co-curricular, extracurricular activity, or school function ever defined. In fact, the glossary where terms were put were completely cut out. And, but this doesn't matter because even in there, these key terms were never defined. If this article passes, at least one of the many thousands of people involved in school boards will inevitably sue the school district. And whether they win or lose, it doesn't matter. This is going to be incredibly costly for the school board. That is money that we cannot afford to lose. Already are we completely short on critical staff, teachers, bus drivers, custodians, bus drivers especially. Some elementary school students are arriving at school at 9.30 a.m. despite all public elementary schools in the county beginning before 8 a.m. By my school, PHS, we started the year with just one custodian. Uh, but don't worry, nowadays we have three custodians to pick up over the over 1,000 students and teachers. If you want to keep the district afloat financially, as well as foster a new generation of strong local leaders such as yourselves, I ask that you remove Article AA on page 67. Ben Shrek, three minutes. Thank you. Oh. I come before you to discuss a matter no less important than one of my own emancipation. I'm here to speak on my own behalf about a clause in the 2023 Rights and Responsibilities Handbook. However, before I do so, it is important to understand the significance of this handbook. By law, school attendance is mandatory, and for me, that means public school. The moment I walk into that public high school, I enter a jurisdiction not unlike that of an embassy or an airline, the only difference being that I'm mandated by law. Thus, I'm speaking about my freedoms, what I can or cannot do and say as mandated by my government. Every single day, in accordance with this document, I hear the phrase, liberty and justice for all. 
But whether or not I get the same liberty and justice as every other American is also regulated by this document. This document determines what I can wear. It determines where I can be. It determines what I can say. And it determines what I can own. Now, it is coming after what I can publish, whether or not I can petition. Whether or not I'm a second-class citizen, having committed the crime of being a student, and thus am to be punished by the removal of my right to petition. Well, while the sparse phrase or line in this document acknowledges my legal protections as an American, the vast majority are restrictions on my freedoms and identity. That is not to say that these restrictions have no purpose. Far from it. I and my colleagues understand and support the mission behind the Rights and Responsibilities Handbook. After all, it protects us. However, every time I look at the clause that criminalizes unauthorized publications with punishments including mandatory school cleanup and mental health services, I can't help but wonder, how am I being protected? How can the land of the free enumerate written threats against my freedoms into law? The First Amendment of the Constitution, as we're taught in class, stipulates, stipulates five protections, freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. In one clause, buried deep within the handbook, 80% of those are directly threatened in one fell swoop. Why would any student like myself support this? The Rights and Responsibilities Handbook does have clauses to punish those who disrupt school functions. The vast majority of the document is full of such. I will, so why is a clause that targets publications even necessary? I will not attempt to hypothesize as to why a targeted, explicit restriction of my First Amendment is in this document. In turn, I ask nothing more and nothing less than the immediate removal of Clause AA on page 67 of the Rights and Responsibilities Handbook before my right to redress of grievances is revoked too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Julia Gibson, you got three minutes. Good evening. I am a student at West Florida High School, but I'm here tonight as more importantly and above all else as an American citizen. And I am here to exercise my First Amendment rights by protesting the addition to the Rights and Responsibility Handbook. Through the First Amendment, we understand that we have the freedom of religion, the freedom to protest and petition the government, we have the freedom of press and the freedom of speech. And through the case of Tinker versus Des Moines, we understand that we do not shed these rights as students when we enter the schoolhouse gate. Sadly, earlier this year, I was told as a female that if I get assaulted at school or anywhere, that there's nothing that they can do because it is our fault. This is a horrible situation, but thankfully we had those First Amendment rights. So we had that right to protest that, and so we did. With this new amendment, we would have had to sit there in silence. Another issue with this is it doesn't just limit the freedom to petition the government, it, re it um, limits our freedom to the press. Through the First Amendment, we have the right to read what we, whatever we want. And with this, and because it's so vague, we will, with publications, anything that students want to read on their personal time even will be limited. And that is just unacceptable. And finally, the most dangerous part about this amendment, it, it is is it is way too vague. People interpret things wildly different. As a student who takes basic English classes, I understand that even if we, if we are interpreting things, we all have different opinions. If, we can't, if everyone can't interpret things such as Shakespeare the same, how are we going to interpret this, um, how are we going to interpret what, dis, what disrupts the school day the same? Administrators, will have the opportunity to take this to it, their advantage and use it against us. Finally, we are the future, and it is your job to make sure that our rights as American citizens are protested. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Sophie, three minutes. And say your last name for me when you get up there. <laughs> My last name is Sarazen. Okay, thank you. Good evening. I'm a freshman at Pensacola High School, and I'm here to talk about Article AA on page 67 on the Rights and Responsibilities Handbook for the year 2022 to 2023. 
While the purpose of this rule is to limit classroom disruptions, it violates our First Amendment rights, specifically our rights to freedom of speech and freedom of expression. It does not allow students to voice their thoughts on their education and improvements that can be made. As stated earlier, this rule is also quite vague. What necessarily constitutes as interfering with the orderly process of the school environment? While I understand you all have the best interest in mind, Article AA needs to be removed from the handbook. On the surface, this rule would reduce disruptions, making our classrooms more effective. As we all know, disruptions can be very destructive to our learning and can distract students from their education. One major disruption which may have caused the fabrication of this rule was the incident with the dress code at West Florida High School, which occurred earlier this school year, when a dean made a certain comment relating to the dress code, which caused major uproar across the student body. Students felt threatened by the words of the dean, and in return, they orchestrated petitions, protests, walkouts, articles, and speeches to show how they felt their school could be benefited. As students, we care about our schools a lot. We spend a lot of our time in school, and it's important that we feel safe and respected in that environment. And when we don't, we are able to exercise our First Amendment rights in speech and protest. I know all of you sitting at the board right now care about education, as you've all dedicated so much of your life here. Everyone speaking here tonight cares about education as well. And I think the problem with this article is that it's putting us into a conflict. School board members and students should not create a conflict. In fact, we should work together. We benefit each other, and it's important that we work together. We have to account for both sides of a story, as we all want the best for our education. The actions you take directly affect us, and the actions we take at school directly affect the vote, vote you vote on. I think what's important is that we revoke Article AA to improve our schools. It is in your best interest to put the education of our county above other issues, so please, I insist that you listen to us. And how is it fair that you all may voice your thoughts on education, while students who are directly affected cannot? I request that you all use your knowledge and wisdom to revoke this rule for the best interest of students that who may become future board members like yourselves. Our education is crucial to our infrastructure. One small step can improve our education to make it the best we all know it can be. We cannot do this without your support. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Brian Pardale. Pardon okay. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, school board members, superintendent, and staff. My name is Ryan Parnell, and I'm an 11th grader at Pensacola High School. I come to you today to request that you uphold the constitutional rights of the students of Escambia County. Article AA of the Secondary Discipline Response Matrix is an unnecessary and avoidable mistake that I hope the school board will not ratify. I think Ron DeSantis put it best when he said, a limited government is much more likely to be a com com competent government, and intervention into students' constitutional rights is a, is a large overstep. The right to petition and assemble are key parts of a functional democracy, and utilization of these rights should be protected and respected instead of discouraged or punished. On October 1st, Pensacola High School began enforcing a policy that barred students from sitting in their cars before school. We, as a student body, saw this as unnecessary and came together and handled the situation in the most mature way someone would go about making change within their government and started a petition. The petition received approximately 200 signatures, and after some months and a few setbacks, uh, the administration stopped enforcing that rule. As well as earlier that year, there was an organized walkout planned over the dress code. Instead of suspending the students for planning to disrupt the orderly school environment, our principal said that she was willing to sit down and talk to the students about their grievances. Although we do not always see eye to eye, I deeply respect her decision to create a dialogue between the administration and the student body. The stated purpose of the Rights and Responsibilities Handbook, according to the coordinator of school engagement, Termi Tompkins, is that it should be used as a guide and that knowing the students, building relationships, and knowing what's necessary is what's most important. Members of this committee, I can promise you that taking away a student's most direct tool of addressing their grievances will only weaken student administration relations. Any kind of restrictions on a right as basic as petition or assemble is a step backwards for our nation, no matter how small or well-intended it may seem. We stand before you today hoping that you will choose to respect our constitutional rights instead of restricting them. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Ian McCarroll, three minutes. Hello, my name is Emma Carroll, and I'm a junior in the IB program at Pensacola High School. Thank you all for your time this evening. I'm here today to discuss the changes being made to the Rights and Responsibilities Handbook, specifically Article AA, the Unauthorized Assembly and Publication section. The proposed update to the handbook completely removes the student's influence over the school's institutional power. 
We have no control over any decisions being made by the school that impact us directly. Furthermore, the new policy prohibits the exchange of ideas through publications both in print and through electronic messaging. The proposed changes are eradicating our right to advocate against school policies without the fear of facing unjust repercussions, and the vague verbiage allows the school a broad scope to inflict disciplinary action. We reserve the right to have a voice within our school and community. If these changes pass, we will be under the impression of remaining quiet in adversity within our future professions and life in general. I implore you today to reconsider these changes because of the detrimental effects that will be carried into our later life. We should encourage younger students to be the change rather than remove their ability to do so. In the 1969 case, Tinker versus Des Moines, the Supreme Court ruled that students do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression once they enter school property. By striking this policy from the handbook, you can save our and future generations' rights and ability to promote change. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Cassandra Smith, three minutes. Good evening, I'm Cassandra Smith, principal of Lincoln Park Elementary School. I want to take a moment to take you back. When I was hired as an assistant principal at a turnaround school, Warrington Middle in 2009, I felt it my duty and responsibility to do everything I could to support my principal, Sandra Rush. I had an office with new furniture in it. However, I resided in the principal's office for the four years I was there. We worked as a team. We bounced ideas off each other, planned staff development, disaggregated data, and more. I'd like to remind you all that Lincoln Park was looking at closure at the end of the 2008-2009 school year. I was fortunate enough to be granted my first and only principalship the following year. I've been there nine years now. For eight years, I worked diligently to make Lincoln Park a great place for students to learn. As a result of a recent serious illness, I spent almost half of last year at home. During my absence, Dr. Moody was one of the many principals that spent time at Lincoln Park. My teachers called me at home to tell me how much they enjoyed her support. I have benefited from Dr. Moody's support. She treats me as if I am Mrs. Rush and she's my Cassandra. We share space as well. She has worked tirelessly at the school. There is not a task that is too large or too small for her. Dr. Moody has also been my angel. I began the school year with limited mobility as a result of loss of bone density due to chemotherapy treatments. Every time I attempt to get up, tend to a task, or walk the building and visit classrooms, Dr. Moody says to me, sit down, baby. I got it. Fortunately, I do have it now. Dr. Moody has done far more to contribute to the success of Lincoln Park this year than I have. She has unselfishly devoted her heart, time, and intellect to promote the success of the school. As a result, she has garnered the respect of the students, staff, parents, and our partners in the community. I implore you to consider Dr. Moody as the next principal of Lincoln Park. As a result of daily observations and shared experiences, I believe she will move the school to the next level. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, ma'am. Andy Tron or Tran? He's coming. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon. My name is Andy Tran, and I'm a student here at the Skamies County School District. I'm here to speak on behalf of the possible addition to the school, uh, student's rights and responsibility handbook. Firstly, I'd like to address a quote by Henry Ward Beecher. 
Liberty is a soul's right to breathe. And when it cannot take a long breath, laws are girdled too tight. I feel as if the addition, which regards our freedom of speech, serves as a gateway of discipline against the student body. But as a student, I feel obligated to address my opinions that this addition steers away from the heart and essence of education. My education is invaluable to me. It has facilitated my growth as a person, and I am proud of the identity I have forged. But also, it has taught me to speak up on behalf of myself and my peers. I strongly feel as though this addition would take, take the right to a voice away from future generations, strangling the functionality of the student body. At the heart of the educational process lies the child, a quote by Lady Bridget Plowden. The, the essence of education is to facilitate the growth of a child, to handle it with gentle and caring hands, providing warmth, not a false impression of protection and safety. I understand that the intent of this edition was to serve as a guide towards a healthy learning environment. However, I, along with many other peers, are under the impression that the ramifications of this article, AA, have been overlooked. This article, if implemented, will only serve to subdue the spirit of the student body. That is all I wish to express for today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we have Warren Wilson, who's donated time to Ty Hamilton. Ty Hamilton, you got six minutes, and you're our last speaker. Unless Mr. Welly tells me otherwise. Good afternoon, board. Thank y'all for this opportunity. It should not take me six minutes. <laughs> um, I'm here on behalf of Dr. Moody at Lincoln Park Elementary School. Um, I'm a parent and have uh, two children there right now. I've had three uh, total children. My other one, he is now at uh, Tate High School. And I just want to say um, that Dr. Moody has shown that she is well qualified. I am also on the parent teacher board at the school. So I'm able to see certain things that's going on in the planning. And that's very important to me as a parent to know that my students are in good hands. Um, I wanna go back a little bit since I do have a few minutes. Uh, Principal Smith has been there um, as she said, the last nine years, my, my children, our children, or guardian, children that we are guardians over have been there for about five years altogether, which the one that was in high school on to the two that's in uh, first grade now, and the, uh, we have one in fourth grade. And one of the important things as a parent is that all of those, my uh, children that we are guardian over um, has different issues and all three has certain issues and what the school did, does and what Principal Smith did is she made sure that she met the needs of each and every child, not just our children, but other children. And it's a different setup, and when I say that, you have children that are kind of maybe not in the upper class where they getting everything that they need. They might not have the parents' participation that they need, but what they do is make sure that your child has everything they need to get to the next level. And so, so far, Dr. Moody has showed us that she has every qualification to get our students to the next level. And the way that Lincoln Park does it is they do it as a team effort. I, I think um, uh, the, one of the teachers, Ms. Hobbs, mentioned that how they do it. And they do it as a team effort. They make sure that if a student needs extra help, that they have other teachers that get involved and get that student up to where they need to be. And that's where they're going. When we go to the parent and teacher meeting uh, with uh, Principal Smith and Dr. Moody, we're talking about goals and things, how to get them to the next level. And they've implemented so many things in place. And so now, if you don't put her there, not, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but I'm just saying that if you try to put someone new in that place, they will have to try to learn all of these new goals and implementation things that have already been put in place and some things that that need to be put in place and they're putting them in place now. Uh, one of the things that they're doing now 
is that they're doing after school. Um, they're, they're, they're doing after school learning. So even after school, if you need some help with some things, they're helping the students get to the next level so they can get to the next grade and not just get there, succeed once they get there. So I'm just want to make sure that you uh, understand how important it is to have someone to meet the needs of each and every student because it's very important and Dr. Moody already knows what to do as Principal Smith I, I've said it in the past at the school that I didn't know who was going to be the next principal uh, at the beginning of uh, last year once I heard that Principal Smith was leaving and I said I don't know because I know what kind of foundation that she built so when I seen Dr. Moody and I seen what she brought to the table, I seen that she would keep it going. And as Principal Smith said a few minutes ago, she can take it to the next level. So I just asked the board to just reevaluate, relook at everything again and see if maybe she is the right person for the job. And my thing is, it wouldn't hurt to maybe give her a chance, even if you say, well, we're going to give you a year. If there's a certain goal or criteria that you're looking for, say we'll give you a year to get to that or two years or whatever that case may be. But just give her a chance to get to those goals that you're looking for. But she's very qualified. She has all the education that you can think of uh, to be a principal. She's already been a principal. She's been a vice principal. She's been a principal. So I just want to say just reevaluate it and look at it again and see if she she's definitely the right person for the job all right thank you all right. thank you sir okay the, the uh superintendent board we've noted the concerns that came for us tonight and the superintendent will respond to us on these issues uh with that i'll close public forum um i was going to ask the board do you, we've been at this for a couple hours do y'all need a break or you keep on going you okay keep going. okay all right. Okay, we're gonna move to the adoption of the minutes. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? So, <clears throat> excuse me, so move. Second. I'll second. Discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, moving to on to administrative appointments. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to adopt the appointments as provided by the superintendent. Do I have a second? Okay. Any discussion? If not, please vote. You want to have yes. the okay? Discussion. So, so you bring in the list. You might want to say who you're up there. Oh, just that one. The one, I'm, one I'm up there. Yeah, I think identify the. What just is that? The one. Sandra Hill. Sandra Hill. Oh, okay. It's just the one. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm good. ready to vote. You good? Mm -hmm. Are we ready to vote? Please vote. Motion carries five zero. Okay, we have uh, three items to be advertised this month. The first item is to change the school board policy, Chapter 2, Human Resources. Is there a motion? So moved. A second? Second. I'm sorry. Discussion. Any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. The next item is changes to the school board policy, Chapter 3, School Operations. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair, I have an, adopt, an amendment. Um, our, our attorney has asked that we uh, amend, and I'll let her explain, but I will state my motion first. Okay. Uh, the amendment is to amend chapter three, on page 7 of 20 under section 4. It's not part of section 4, but I'm just trying to help people find it. The last sentence uh, to read that the, this will be an additional sentence that reads, the waiver does not apply to adult students enrolled in adult education programs who are lawfully licensed pursuant to section 790 
1.06 Florida statute. Do we have to vote on the amendment first? We have to yes, vote you, on the amendment. Uh, whoever whoever uh, moved the item in the first place has to agree to the amendment. Okay. And Patty well, I, I move, I move. Who, would, who did the initial? Paul. Paul. I will move. Isn't it better Consensus just for us to vote on the amendment? And there. then vote on the motion as amended? Because we're going to have to. We're going to have to. He is the one who has it. moved approval of of the item as it stands presently. You have seconded and right. asked that it be amended. So if he consents to the amendment, then that becomes his uh, what what he oh, has okay. has moved. Uh, all right, and this is the recommendation of the the attorney. I move that we do it with the addition as provided by the attorney. Okay, and do we have a second? Uh, oh, that so already have, seconded. Seconds already, okay. So now we're just going to vote on the amended. Uh, Unless there's uh, further discussion. Unless there's discussion. Okay. And yes, Bill? Yes, Madam Attorney. Would you just give us a thumbnail on uh, <laughs> Section 790.06 yes. Florida statute? 790.06 is the statute that covers uh, concealed carry permits. Um, and uh, as I, I sent the board an email and the superintendent an email, um, and it's my understanding that the superintendent is at least indicated that he is in agreement with my recommendation that this amendment be put forth. Um, when we were looking at this rule, which prohibits people from having uh, firearms securely encased in their vehicles. Um, I noticed that there was an apparent conflict between the statute that gives school boards that authority and the con concealed carry law. Specifically, there is a section in the concealed carry law that says no person who is licensed under this section can be prohibited from carrying or storing a firearm in their vehicle. And that is pretty express language. Um, and um, the board had already indicated that it wanted to keep this limited to students, um, and a question arose with regard to um, what happens with adult students who are attending George Stone. Um, and I, I am of the opinion that the school board has the authority to um, basically make it a crime for somebody to have a firearm, secure, even securely encased in their vehicle, um, if, if they're, regardless of their age. So if they're an adult student, if they're a citizen, if they are somebody who is parking on our, our grounds, the school district has the authority to um, prohibit the secure encasement of firearms on, on school property. Um, however, this, this apparent conflict was created with the concealed carry law. I was finally able to get through to the Attorney General's office this morning. Um, and had an informal conversation with them. They, they do not give formal opinions over the phone. Uh, there's a whole process that you have to go through to do that, but we did, we did bounce ideas off of each other, and they, they absolutely agreed that there is an ambiguity between those two concepts, the school board's authority to uh, waive the protections of uh, 790.115, which um, is another section that reiterates the ability of people to securely encase vehicles, uh, firearms in their vehicles, and the rights of concealed carry uh, permit holders. Um, there is a concept in the criminal law, since violation of this policy could constitute a crime, somebody could be arrested for it. Um, I looked at the criminal statutes and rules of statutory construction when it comes to crimes, and it says that whenever there is an ambiguity in the law, it must be resolved in favor of the accused. And so I felt it was appropriate to look at um, this rule through that lens to see how any possible challenges down the road might be uh, or issues might, might be resolved. Um, and so I felt that the clearest thing to do would be to just state that um, if somebody has a concealed carry permit, then I don't believe that the board has the authority to say that they cannot have a firearm securely encased in their vehicle because of um, 790.06. I'm not a judge, I can't make that determination, but I think that for the sake of the board going forward, uh, it is a more defensible position than just saying, you know, leaving it vague. Any other discussion? Yes, ma'am. 
I, <clears throat> excuse me, when I spoke to Ms. Odom, I wanted to make sure that it was very clear that guns are still not allowed inside the buildings. Absolutely, even with concealed carry permits, unless it is for a school-sponsored or school-related activity. Any other discussion? Yes, sir. Well, the only other oh, thing is, uh, Bill, the superintendent. You didn't. Did you finish? You didn't name no. You just went ahead to her. I'll defer. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. <laughs> superintendent. Just for clarification point, that would impact with the adult, the term adult school, that limits where this is pertinent. Right, B because. Um, the numbers. People, people who, uh, you can't get a concealed carry permit until you're 21 anyway. Right. So um, that, it, it really is not relevant to the secondary level of school. Okay, thank you. Bill. So we can be confident that any student who's filed in violation with a weapon on campus that our sheriff department will react accordingly. The sheriff is a separate constitutional officer who always has the right to decide whether or not um, to make an arrest or to take law enforcement action. Um, this is something that gives him the authority to act if he deems it appropriate. Uh, a, a situation in which we found ourselves previously he did not feel that he had the authority to act. Now he does. Because of the lack of our policy? Absolutely. Okay. So that loophole is being closed by this, yes. but other citizens who might drive onto our campus, be they parents, salesmen, et cetera, are safe as long as they leave it right where it is. It has to be securely encased in the vehicle and not uh, not accessible for ready use. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? If not, I would like to thank our, our board attorney. Just great job on going through all that legal language and getting us landing in the right spot. So thank you, Ellen. Okay, if no other discussion, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, the last item is change the students' rights and hand, responsibility handbook for the 2022-2023 school year. Is there a motion? And this is, for a okay, this for is for advertisement. It's just for advertisement, And yes. it can, it will not come up till? June. June. Due to the number of days required for advertising, right. our next meeting will not be within the time frame that we need it to be. So it's getting pushed over into June. Okay. Then I will make a motion we adopt the policy as listed in letter D. 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 Thank you. Thank You're you. Second. The amended. Advertising it. For advertising. For advertising. Yes. Not adopting. And I will second that for discussion. All right. Discussion? Mr. Fesco? My first question is to the attorney. Um, I don't know, maybe it's really to Mr. Tompkins. Mr. Tompkins, has this policy, has, has this section been changed, altered, or deviated from anything that was previously there? Are you talking about AA? AA, page 67. Actually, 66. 66. Let's that is the section that was um, brought before the committee and the committee looked at. Now, I will tell you that I will defer to the legal counsel uh, based on uh, a question that I had to her today as far as that and, and maybe clarification of this point prior to us coming in here. And I want to say um, to the students that spoke there, great civics students. Yeah, and, did a great um, job. I do appreciate their... Um, expressiveness in here and um, I think this may help a little bit for clarification if you'd like to speak to that so um, my read of the rule um, kudos to all of the students very impressive if any of you have interest in a career in the law I would be happy to sit down <laughs> with any one of you and and talk about options and whatnot you you should all be commended for 
your eloquence and your passion and your engagement. Um, I do not read the rule as narrowly as you do. Um, there is a phrase in there which disrupts this, the orderly operation of the school. Um, what that means is I do believe that students have the right to circulate petitions. I do believe they have the right to protest. They do not have the right to disrupt the operation of the school. Um, and uh, it may be that this proposed um, section could be more artfully worded, or perhaps if we put some language in there that said nothing in this rule should be construed to prohibit with the First Amendment rights of students um, as long as they do not disrupt the orderly operation of the school. That is something for the board to consider. But um, one of the things I noted that a lot of you took note of the fact that um, school disruption appears in other sections, but um, one of the fundamental principles of due process is that you have notice of what is prohibited. And so this rights and responsibilities handbook is an effort to um, describe as broadly as possible those kinds of activities that could get you in trouble. And I'll give you an example. Um, I think there is absolutely nothing wrong with distributing a, pit, a petition about the student parking situation at PHS. Now, um, does that mean that a student should be able to get up in the math in the middle of a math class and start passing around the petition when the teacher is trying to engage in instruction? Absolutely not. They do not have the right to do that. Um, do students have the right to get up and walk out of the school grounds and walk across the street um, in, in order to protest something? And the answer is no, you cannot do that without consequence. Um, because the school district is charged with educating students, keeping you safe, and students are expected to follow, uh, follow the rules and regulations that are put there. To, and I really, really appreciate, uh, I believe it was you who acknowledged that the rules are there for your safety. Um, and if, you know, if students are just free to get up and walk out whenever they want, it could become very difficult for us to um, achieve the mission of educating students. But um, I do not, again, I don't believe that this rule is, um, I don't think it does what, how you are reading it. Um, again, acknowledging that it could be, it could be phrased more um, clearly, or perhaps some, some additional clarification could be inserted if that is the will of the board. Um, I would say that it was never the intent right. uh, of this to take away any rights uh, from the students as far as their First Amendment rights, but it is there specifically for what Ms. Odom has stated, the fact that it is for that disorderly um, process. Um, and, and if there can be some wordsmithing of this, that's it. I do want to say, and then I'll be done, that I do want to say this. I appreciate the fact that the students have already read uh, the um, <laughs> document. That means that we've made major progress <laughs> as far as the um, this portion of the handbook, and that's what it's for. So, um, you know, once again, uh, congratulations to the students uh, for bringing this up, and uh, I'm sure we'll work this out. My my question is: This new to the Rights and Responsibilities Handbook? Okay, so, so nothing along these lines has been in there heretofore. I mean, it has. It fell underneath um, disruption before, which is very vague in its own right. And so in the effort to do what we were trying to do, which is expand this and clarify it so that students knew exactly what these definitions were, it had to go through this process. And that goes to what Ms. Odom directly spoke about. It doesn't mean that we can't refine it. Uh, that's what I believe this document's for, and we always continue to do that. And so um, that we always love input. And that's why we had the open sessions as far as that's concerned, in which students and parents were able to be a part of, and those that uh, attended did give their input. Mr. Fetzko, you know you were a part of those. And, um, and, and so, but we always um, do this process every year, and we seek that input from everyone. And so, once again, 
Uh, it is an open process and it's always a continuously changing document every year and, and we move on with that. Bill? I just want to make sure that I'm saying this correctly. If we pass this tonight, I think the students need to understand this just gets things started. It is not meaning this is the final product, correct ma'am? It's not the absolute final product, but you generally want to be wary of uh, doing something that is going to substantially deviate from what has been advertised. Right, but at the same time, we're also taught, caught on a time crunch of getting this ready for publication for the beginning of next school year. Is that correct? Correct. So, and so, I, I, it's really not in the board's hands until we do pass something. It goes back, I guess, to committee. I, I would I would recommend that if the board is inclined to add some kind of verbiage to clarify this, I think I think if the board wants to strike it, they can do that. If they want to set, add some verbiage to clarify it, they can do that as well. And probably what would be the cleanest thing to do would be what we did with the other thing that the board go ahead and do an amendment at the table uh, for incorporation into the document. Um, and one of the things that might be a good idea, again, hearkening to the marvelous input that we had from the students, um, it may be appropriate to put something in the glossary that defines um, Disruption something that interferes with the orderly process of the school environment. And one of the things that I would propose uh, is something along the lines of uh, that it would be any behavior that a reasonable person would view as being likely to substantially or repeatedly interfere with the conduct of class or school operations. Okay. Uh, Patty? Um, you read my mind because that was um, because it is, it obviously is a difference in the way you're reading it. You're reading it from a legal standpoint. The rest of us are reading it as just regular people. And I wanted to be sure, because so if we add that, um, a definition for unauthorized assembly and publications, so yeah, because I'm also having an issue with the author, unauthorized publications. What does that mean? Does that mean, how do, how do we determine what's an authorized publication? I, I don't, the way I read this is um, every single one of those that is listed must interfere with the orderly process of the school environment. It's not just one. Um, so I, I don't know what would constitute an unauthorized publication. I know that, you know, back in my day, kids wrote zines and they distributed, distributed them around to each other and it was never an issue. Um, but if, if something was, um, you know, inappropriate from prevailing community standards, possibly right. illegal, um, the, and it's something that um, disrupts the orderly operation of the school, then uh, it is something that could result in discipline. Okay, Paul? I'd, I'd, um, I'd like to see the addition as a, the attorney first said, that some statement or phrase, even if it's in Parens, it says nothing is intended to remove First Amendment rights, and with that, then I'm I'm good with it the way that it is. That's you what know, we do. Uh, that statement, because our intent is not to remove rights, the rights of students to do things in an orderly and an appropriate fashion. Um, but there's also, and, and I, I'd feel remiss if I didn't say, the operation of the school is left to the super or to the administration the principal has a lot to say about what happens at a school and, and i think that students work with the administration and not in opposition or against or in spite of and, and that's where i see that there needs to be some understanding we don't set schools up to be independent democracies <laughs> <laughs> the schools are set up with a, a infrastructure in place so that the the authority is this the principal but if the principal is ruling in a way or, 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 or administering in a way then there are recourses that the students and, and this group has shown that 
there's, there's discussion, there's, there's uh, the appropriate steps to be taken. Uh, but I do want to reiterate that I'm a firm believer that the, the principal is, set the, is sent and works there to maintain the orderly operation of the school and things need to go through that principal. I, I agree with the change that uh, Paul suggested. So, um, uh, May I make a suggestion? Yes. I was going to make a motion. Oh. Do you want to go ahead and well, say Well, I was just going to, I was going to offer to some, some verbiage to see if it, yeah. if it, okay. is, if it had... accomplishes what, what we're discussing. Um, that following that blurb, there be something, it can be in parentheses or not, um, nothing in this uh, section rule should be construed as prohibiting the free exercise of a student's constitutional rights so long as their conduct or speech does not material and substantially interfere with the orderly operation of the school. Okay. Can that be as an asterisk that would apply to the entire section so that if, we, if there's something else in there that, that it's very clear? Okay. Dr. Dr. Edler, are you okay with that change? Okay. All right. Bill? Good, but superintendent. If I can just, one, one question I had, Ms. Odom, is how, in doing this, does it have any impact in our timeline? I, I don't think it does, but it doesn't. just wanted it, to it check It doesn't, on it. as long as we get the verbiage down and the board approves it. Um, I'll make sure that I have it written down, and or I guess Mrs. Deweese uh, will have a recording of it, yeah. so we will be able to determine exactly what it is that you're looking for. Okay. Um, so, and then again, another, another um, suggestion is I, I don't think it would be a bad idea to have something in the glossary that specifies that um, uh, prohibited disruptive conduct is conduct which a reasonable person would believe um, would material and substantially interfere with the orderly operation of the school. I'm, I'm okay would with Paul, you okay with it? Good with that. Dr. Taylor? Good. Okay. Bill? All right. We're getting the patty. Patty? <laughs> well, I just wanted to know, if, would it be appropriate for us to um, advertise it with the understanding that before it goes to print, the attorney has as long has as made long that. as the basic concept is there. I'd minor, hate to say minor, some, yeah. Right. Minor wordsmithing is absolutely uh, acceptable in rulemaking. Okay. Um, but it, again, as long as we are not substantially deviating from what it is that you have approved, then then we can make those kinds of minor wordsmithing modifications. So we could make an amendment that we add the the information in the words that you will come up with the other words that we are not uh, prohibiting any free. I, I think that I think that what you can say, because again, w what is going to be advertised to the public is not the exact verbiage of this. This this thing is not going to appear in the newspaper. There will be a simple explanation explaining that this is going to be uh, there will be a public hearing for the final adoption on this item and a copy can be obtained from the superintendent's office. Or through, um, on our website. I right. mean, everybody has the opportunity to look right. at it the minute, I mean, they have the opportunity before the meeting and they will have the opportunity when Holly puts it out for publication, I mean, for that, she'll also put on the website the what's being advertised. So, I, I mean. Right, and so this, this would be, all. there would be an opportunity but at that public hearing and for all of you, if you want to see this thing getting across the finish line, if you guys are not doing early going off to college, um, come to the meeting in June and, and you'll see the whole thing being finalized. Um, and at that time, I think it would be appropriate if the school board members, uh, you have the right to be heard again. Um, and you have the right to know what, what any proposed um, revisions may be. Um, and so if we do want to come up with a variety of different, um, different phraseology, um, the board members have the right to bring that if they want. Um, I would be happy to send you what it is that I've, I've just crafted and read to you. Um, if you want to tweak that, I have no pride of authorship. I don't mind. Uh, if somebody can say it better than I can, I'm, I'd gladly yield. But uh, we can certainly say that the board wants to include this in an asterisk in that section and include a definition for what constitutes um, material 
you know, dis disorderly, disorderly or disruptive conduct. Unauthorized assembly and in publications. Hey, uh, Superintendent. I I'd just like to go on the record saying I appreciate uh, this conversation and uh, Ms. Odom, I, I fully support the recommendation that you've made. Um, it's great when we can, because there are some changes in this document and the goal is to have it as effective, as clear, as concise as possible. So I think we are, th this is in the right direction because there has, what we've heard is that there are some differing viewpoints on it. So any step we can take to be more clear, I think, and more precise, uh, given the the parameters that we need to have, I, I think that works. And, and I also would like to put one uh, other shameless plug forward. We need good attorney students, but we also need good teachers. So just remember that. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so we're going to vote on this as according to our, how we agreed to amend this, right? Right. I think there would need to be because there was there was a um, a motion to a approve the advertising. There was a second for discussion, so now there would need and to be a motion I, to amend. I amended and I said to change the verbiage. Okay. And, uh, okay, so we got it from there. Okay. And so has there been a second of that or has, uh, who was the initial? Didn't say that, Holly. Okay, to do it as amended or? Okay, so we, we do not have a motion to amend or a second. I kept yet. trying to do it, but I kept so right then <laughs> I want to make a motion to amend what we advertise <laughs> to include the changes in the sections as talked about at length <laughs> and agreed upon by everybody in, uh, at least, you know, in spirit. <laughs> okay. Do I still need to get a second on that? There second. has to be a second for the amendment. Okay. I will second it. Okay. Any more discussion? Uh, just we're, only going, uh, we're only voting on this particular amendment at this point because that was a separate item. Okay. okay. Just clarifying. We're voting on whether or not to allow the amendment. Yes. Right. Okay. Any other discussion? And, and, and uh -huh. may, may I be clear, and this is for Ms. Dewey's benefit in the minutes, um, are you speaking to both the parenthetical in Rule AA and the definition? Right, both yes. of them in the yes. definition. Yes. Okay, if all minds are satisfied, let's vote on the amendment. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, so now we'll go back to vote on, on the other. Okay, do I have a motion? I, you had a motion. I, oh, I have a. They got a motion and a second, so we go ahead and vote. I, All right. I, I, unless yeah. there's discussion I on am, other matters. I have discussion on the whole document. Hmm? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was just one part. Oh. Um, one of the things I, I know many, uh, all of you should have received, and we had Ms. Dollar speak, and one of the things that, um, that is, I was reading her suggestions. I had a conversation with Mr. Tompkins. I had a conversation with Ms. Odom. Um, and as one of the board members that appreciates committee work, um, it's, it's difficult at this particular juncture in time to come back and try to, to think about what the committee should have done. Because, and I wanted to take this opportunity. I think he's still here. Where did Dr. Roberts is? He had to step away for a moment, away from Mrs. Moment. Hightower. Well, I'll keep talking until he comes back. No, um, but I wanted him to talk about the, the it, maybe Mr. Fetzko, you can do it. Um, <laughs> I've heard from various people that he did an amazing job of putting the committee together this time. He had various parent representatives, he had student representatives, um, and I wanted the public to understand that process of how the committee was formed and how in the future, I'm, I've had a conversation with Ms. Odom about um, how better to communicate to the public. I know we advertise it, um, but you know, and if you see it on our website, it'll say meeting of the rights and responsibility handbook. It may not be um, a, an assumption that you can come to that meeting. I mean, it may, it may, you know, you may just see it and think there's a committee that's formed because it's the rights and responsibility committee meeting. 
Um, so I think that that um, in the future, I'd like to see us, you know, maybe uh, I think I talked to Mr. Struthers and, and being able to put more on our website in the way of advertising instead of just always in the newspaper, I think that will be helpful. But I, I do think that, um, and what I intend to do with these these things, because um, um, is, is share them so that they will be, in, be considered in the future, uh, because these are well thought out, very well, um, very well delivered, um, but again, we had a committee, they had um, various meetings. How many meetings did they have? Four? And um, there was a number of people on the committee. I've had people tell me that the students made an invaluable um, um, addition to the committee, so. Um, but I, I just kind of wanted the public to understand that it wasn't just Dr. Roberts or Dr. Smith and the attorney putting this together. It was it was a four com, four meetings. Um, there was a lot of discussion. You want to share with your well, opinion? I, I will say that the committee was made up, and Dr. Roberts went to great uh, lengths to tr try to find as much cross representation as he could. There were principals and administrators from every level, elementary, middle, and high. There were deans. There were parents. Uh, there were, Mr. Tompkins, I don't know if you know better how this happened. It was advertised. That's how I knew that, you know, uh, to attend if I so chose. But I also knew that if I attended one, I needed to attend all. It's not a come in and, you know, because you move to do sections of the handbook. It's not that you could come in at the fourth meeting and say, oh, I want to go back to the very beginning and change everything. So when somebody does it, they make a commitment to be a part of the entire process and not kind of cherry pick where they want to come in and, and talk and, and not be there. But, but how he organized it is something that Dr. Roberts has taken upon himself and to be very inclusive and cross-sectional. Mr. Tompkins. Once again, uh, Dr. Roberts is unable to be here. He had to step away. But um, one thing, and we talked about this also, uh, Everybody that was on that committee, regardless, um, as far as parents were concerned, or parents that reached out because of the advertisement, and he was able to have that representation that was on here. And I know that we had representation from students, from uh, parents at different grade levels, and so they actually did see the advertisement and they reached out to um, the uh, director's office and, and he selected them to be a part of that. But uh, the school representation, he did want to make sure that there was representation from all areas, uh, both at high school, elementary, and um, middle school, and then also uh, the district level offices that needed to be a part of that also. So it was a collaborative effort across that, um, I think it was total of three meetings that uh, we did and going through it chapter by chapter working through that and we started in January uh, with that process and that's usually when it starts so um, it was um, I really believe uh, very well attended and the input was very um, beneficial to the process and so I would encourage anyone I mean we advertise that and with the more representation that we can have, uh, the better it is and the better the document will become over time. And, and we did also have members of the public who attended oh, yes. who right. just showed up. So. Any other discussion? Great job, great job. Thank you, Mr. Tompkins. Huh? Did yes, thank you, sir. Not We're getting yet. ready to vote. Not yet. We have not voted. We're getting ready to vote right now. Well, Ms. Hightower yeah. may still have questions. So you yeah, that was that was um, basically. I just wanted to make sure that people understood. I thought the students did an amazing job, um, and and one of the things that um, always um, and, and, and Mr. Slayton alluded to it. Um, we have a public hearing scheduled in June. My opinion has always been that if somebody brought something that we on the board thought was a valid concern 
that we should address, that we had the right to do it there, and it did not have to go back for advertisement. That, would, that is what I'm asking you. It's a public hearing. Anyone from the public can be here. If we change anything at that point, the public was noticed that there was a possibility of change. Would that be correct or not? It depends on how substantial a deviation it is. Okay. Um, I, I would, if it, if it is going to substantially change it, I would take the position that it needs to be re-advertised. Uh, if, if there is wordsmithing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Simple wordsmithing, something that does not, um, uh, and, and I would say this, if it's something that grants people greater rights, then I think that, that it is something that can be um, adopted. If it is something that is more restrictive of people's rights, I would uh, absolutely recommend that it be re-advertised for a 28-day period. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. All right. Okay, our next item of business, approval of the consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. I get a second? Second. Okay, I, I was gonna ask if items be pulled, but I, I have already asked Elizabeth to pull item 15C, 2021-2022, instructional materials adoption. I just want to put that out in front before we get going. All right, so any other items in curriculum? Finance. Human resources. Mr. Chair. Yes. Trying to find where I'm looking for. Under under section 25 instructional professional. Section I'd like hold on a minute. We get to it. I'd like to pull G oh, for discussion. Geez. This went past it. Hold on, man. Let's see. Miss Hightower, mm -hmm. if you pull G, will you also pull K? Just, in, just in K? Okay, yes. The just planning in case. document? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, J and uh, no, G as in oh, good. Okay. And K because okay, if so G, whatever the discussion is might might affect K as well. Okay, and then K. So those two items. Thank you be for that pulled. reminder. K. All right. Okay, so we got to prove the. Um... Are there any other items? We got we got to vote on uh, any other items to be pulled. Is that it? No, you still have other places to go. I went to operations. <laughs> okay. That's the last stop, I hope. <laughs> We're going to need to bring some chocolates up here or something for these long meetings. Okay, going once, twice, thrice. Okay, all right, so we're gonna vote on the consent agenda minus the pulled items. So do I get a um, motion to approve the agenda minus the pulled items? I already had that. Oh. Hmm? I already have a what? motion. You got a motion? <laughs> no, we already, we already have a we motion. We already had a motion, a that's in we got a second? Okay. Please vote. Thank you, Bill. Motion carries 5-0. I remember. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, now I need a, a motion on the item 15 C 2021-2022 instructional materials adoption. Move the uh, approval of the instructional <coughs> materials as listed in the agenda documents. Second. I'll second. And, and before we go into there, I, I talked to Ms. Odom and Steve Marcani about it today, and I wanted Ms. Odom to kind of lay this out on uh, why this is happening. So the original um, instructional materials that were up for adoption for the math curriculum that have, has now been deleted, um, the State Board of Education um, generally approves educational materials on, well, I would say on the front end, but often it is done after school districts have been charged with adopting their instructional materials. Um, on Friday, the um, State Board of Education flagged about 40%. Our, our member of the media would know better than I off the top of uh, our some 40% of the instructional materials that were submitted by publishers were rejected for various reasons. Um, and several of the ones that our committee had selected and ranked uh, either first or as a, the alternate to the first selection were flagged by DOE. And so in consultation with uh, Ms. White, um, we decided that the best way to go forward would be to the materials that we selected that passed muster with the Board of Education, we would go ahead and approve those so that, or have you approve them, um, so that we can go ahead and start ordering and, and getting those textbooks and the teacher instructional materials in as soon as possible, and then we would await further guidance from DOE. Uh, there is an appeals process for the publishers to ask DOE to specifically identify the deficiencies in the materials that they've provided. Um, and so if it is revealed that some of the uh, textbooks that we've selected are subsequently, if the publishers are able to fix whatever the issues are, then uh, we would just move on to adopting those materials. Uh, if they are not successful in correcting the deficiencies, then we would need to look at other items um, further down the list. Mr. Superintendent, do you have a comment on top of that? Y yes, I do. Um, the, the, the concern I have with this whole process is that our team has worked very, very hard on this, been very diligent, got out in front of this, because these are new standards and new curriculum materials. It's imperative that our teachers are equipped with the resources that they need, and that includes, ideally, we'd like to have that into teachers' hands where there are training opportunities prior to the start of the school year. And, and I, I think the um, conundrum that can arise is if those materials come in late, and because it is quite a lengthy, drawn-out process. Um, so it, that's just something we have to be mindful while certainly complying with the Department of Education. We, we want to do that, um, but that's the, that's the challenge right there is because it's great if we can have some training where teachers can see the materials and become immersed with them early. Thanks, sir. Bill? Mr. Superintendent or Mr. Marcanio, how many textbooks did we lose? So um, we are, we have stricken from the document the K through five adoption. So the materials for all kindergarten through fifth grade, that's the biggest group of students that would be affected by this amendment. And then um, the, the, uh, the next two courses are math for college liberal arts and then probability and st statistics honors. Um, and so, and for that course, we actually have materials that we're currently using, and if we had to, we could continue to use those. But certainly the K-5 is the- All K-5. Yes, sir. All K-5 in math, and I want everybody to hear that. It wasn't a matter of, oh, they took a book. They took all the K-5 math. That's what we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Did, did they have anything else to offer on the 
I see they're standing there. Is that what you're looking yeah. at, Patty? Or we do, we do have Miss Danielson, who is our math specialist um, here tonight, as well as Michelle White, and they can answer any other questions that you have um, based on this um, process. Okay, Patty. Um, how long does the appeal process usually last? That's 20, does anybody have an idea? 20 days, is that correct? We don't have a specific time at this point. Publishers have 21 days to appeal. Now, we don't know if they start early, does clock sticking, start ticking for DOE to make a decision, or do they wait the full 21 days? So at most, 21 days for publishers to submit that appeal, and then we do not know what the turnaround time is for DOE either. And do we have the option, as he said, we with, with statistics and probability, do we have the option of continuing with the court with the books that we have today? Because I know we have new standards that are rolling in. Uh, no, ma'am. At this time, because we have so many shifts in the standards and benchmarks moving from grade level, the current material would not um, be sufficient in the best interest for our students. So that is why I am very much in favor of waiting and to see what we can do with that appeal process. And we do know that some publishers have already started their appeal process as of Monday. Um, they overnighted their material to DOE. So it would be a large gap holes um, for our students and for our teachers. I, I wanted to make sure people understood that. Yes, ma'am. Because we are starting new standards yes, that will be assessed in the future. Yes, ma'am. And oh. further clarification for Mr. Slayton, for our top pick, it was their first grade only that had a problem with social and emotional learning. They think, they still don't know from the state what their specific problems are with the adoption, but that is what they think is in there. So it's one title out of K-5 for them. It is a full adoption. It's not you can pick K-1, 3, and 4. They do K-5 as a set, so that's why they were rejected as a whole. So publishers are still waiting to find out exactly what they need to fix. They just have to appeal first and get that feedback from the state. Okay, Paul. So my uh, question has to deal with. He's still waiting. <clears throat> my question has to deal with. There could be problems that arise. I suppose this is the last year for FSA. The new standards will be part of the new progress monitoring. So if our materials don't match those standards, even the progress monitoring will be harmed. Now, is there a new progress monitoring, monitoring platform or tool that's aligned to those new standards, or will what we're currently using suffice in any way, shape, or form? Uh, I, currently, the state has adopted STAR for pre-K to second grade and then Cambium for third through eighth for math, uh, 10th grade through ELA. Um, our current progress monitoring, we do not know what exactly that looks like with, I'm sorry, with Cambium. Um, we are waiting more information. We had our state meeting last month and we're waiting on the Test Development Center to give us an update. But what we currently have for progress monitoring will not work. They are working, the current mo progress monitoring have started to adapt to the best standards. Um, and so, again, this will be the first year to see how all of those will come together in the perfect alignment. Standards, curriculum, and assessments. Now, we're currently using STAR 360. Is that for math, English, language, arts, and science? Math and language arts. Okay. And so STAR 360 would not be an appropriate instrument for... It will be for K2, K2. Um, and 3.5, they have started to show us what they're doing for an alignment for next okay, year. So, so STAR 360, is are, they are making those adjustments? Yes, sir. Okay, that, that gives me some hope. Bill? No, I'm lost. I'm just, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, it's unbelievable to wait to such a date. And all of a sudden, you're affecting a state as large as Florida with the potential of not having the correct textbooks in hand with a new monitoring system. Doesn't look good for us, I'm sorry. But ladies, if my only thing would be if, if 
something happens before the next board meeting and you need to call and ask for a special board meeting, the superintendent can certainly do that and I don't think anybody would mind coming in and taking care of any problems. So that's up to y'all. I think, I think it's important to note that you have a school board rule that specifically says that the adoption of instructional materials has to happen in a regular school board meeting. It cannot oh. be a special board meeting. Okay. That's what I said. No. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> you need to quit reading all those policies, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Uh, before you go, I got a good question. Okay. Chair has to go last. Now, when we're discussing STAR 360 and the impact, uh, what I'm understanding in the examples I've seen is like where they say uh, it's a sales statement where it says what can I do today to help build a re good relationship with a classmate. So that's what I'm hearing is what the particular problem is and when it comes to sale that really doesn't affect the content of the work being done right in math. That is that is my opinion as well. Okay. Because we do have the students and hope the students are working together and solving problems together and collaborating okay. um, in the math classrooms. Okay. All right. So that's what I just want to clarify. So, okay. You know, the discussion? You're done, huh? Okay. If, if all, all mine satisfied, let's please vote. I, I hope I'm at the right point. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, I'll need a motion on item 25G. Do I have a motion? I, I, I guess the we button. do want to take them separate, G and K. Move the adoption of item G under 25. 25, yes. Okay, instructional professional. Okay, do I get a second? I'll second it. All right, discussion. Yes, um, I, I apologize that I had to leave the discussion workshop on Thursday early. I had to be at my church for an event. Um, and I uh, did not get to talk about the um, amending the job description for the administrative recording secretary that is being amended to public relations assistant. And my concern is um, is that uh, as the administrative recording secretary, the intent is that that person is responsible for the minutes of our organization acting. I know that the superintendent's role, uh, according to statute, is as the executive secretary. His responsibility is actually making sure all this happens. Um, and I uh, and so as the re administrative recording secretary, that says to me that the primary duty in that position is board related. Um, moving it to public relations assistant, I think shifts the intent of that job. And maybe that is the purpose of, of renaming it, but I just needed to have that conversation because I, I um, I understand with the with the changes that have been uh, suggested, it does give the recording secretary some additional responsibilities um, related to public relations. Um, but those are my concerns, and I didn't know whether anybody else had thought about it. Superintendent, you have a comment? Sure. Yes. I, so the the purpose on this design of this position is to. Um, have that position associated in the communication realm. A lot of this work does fall under, it is, it is public, um, but also I think we're able, by doing this we're able to have that position support communications while maintaining, still with the ability to accomplish the, the, the work that's uh, involved with the recording secretary. So um, this recrafts that position, um, but it's certainly, we, we're not going to let those job tasks that currently are in place fall by the wayside because they have to be done. 
so that's a it's absolutely a priority. But where we can also support, in addition, some of the um, communications department, that's what we're looking for. So it's really uh, it, it's looking at broadening the scope of that position. So if you have questions, feel free to ask. I don't know how clear that was. Well, I probably do, but at this moment, I don't know that I could formulate the right questions. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that the existing responsibilities aren't sufficient to consume the person's entire time. And, and if that were the case, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I question, is there sufficient time within that position to assume more responsibilities? I, I also understand that we're not trying to create new positions and increase budgets and we're trying to work within our means. Um, I just, I don't know. Um, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot. I, I think there's another transition that's happened too in going to board docs. There's been some, I would say, increased efficiencies. Right. in the in the processes and so that i think board docs has been a a helpful conversion for us in our our format um, but certainly it's something that we would uh, you know that's something we would keep a an eye on because as i said we can't jeopardize this responsibility so if that becomes problematic we'll we'll of course need to adjust but um, I, I go back that I, I wish that this discussion had occurred at the workshop um, and that it, it highlighted it at that point. Um, I, I, <laughs> I keep going back to uh, a very wise lady who was a and the head of fiddlers who had a needle point above her desk, and I've shared this with you, Superintendent. You never know what you could do until you have to undo what you did. <laughs> and and I don't want to put us in a position for us to get that knowledgeable to know <laughs> how to undo what we did. I'd rather not do it than than undo it. Um, I, other people have questions, concerns, comments. Um, Dr. Hitler, I'll yeah. wait on you yeah. first, Paul. I think the job description for me would kind of describe what this person would be doing. And I believe then that would enable me to come up with another job title rather than to say um, um, uh, that secretary or that um, media person. You got them doing a couple of things. I believe that should be described in the job description, and it sounds more like an administrative assistant to me, for lack of a better title, than to be confusing with the two different titles. Bill, you have a comment? Yeah, forgive me uh, for not being thorough enough in looking at that. I know, I just realized it myself. Um, could I ask, this is April, what type of uh, problem would it cause if we delayed this item until next month? We can discuss it at workshop. I'd have to to look to someone for guidance, but we would, uh, whether we could take this particular position out of the PPD and still do the PPD would be the question. You can always amend the PPD to later yeah. meeting it, you know. 
right now this position as administrative recording secretary does not exist it's been stricken right what he's saying we could amend this uh, I, I think if I, might, I think what you could do is with item G you could do separate motions on each of the uh, individual job descriptions the remaining three um, and then when we get to the personnel planning document you could uh, vote to approve the PPD uh, with the exclusion of the item that is not being um, considered so could we approve G with the exception of the recording secretary okay so, um, and I, I kind of agree with this, Superintendent. I, I didn't actually realize myself, and it's such an important position for the board. I'd like for us to have a little bit more discussion on that myself. Um, okay, S any other discussions? I also wanted to, to go on record as saying that we as a board have been very, um, very determined to make sure that our public relations situation our our uh, our ability to get out to the public the information is paramount we we need know that's important that's why we have the contracts with the id group that's why we're going through that whole process of you know the the changes to tr strategic plan and to to strengthen that and and so i want to make sure that if our public relations department, office, whatever, needs help that we make sure that, that that occurs also. I just don't know that this is the way to do it. Mr. Yes. Mr. Chairman, yes, second way. Uh, and that, that certainly is a need, and we would have loved to add it a position, but we are having a situation where we have declining enrollment, so adding a position did not seem prudent. Um, you know, in a situation like this, you have to be careful when you're talking about the position and then the, the, the and then when you get to the individual in the position, spoken with the individual, and there's there's a, the the ability certainly is is there, um, and uh, so it's not a so those conversations have been had, but um, again. The, the person and the position uh, I, I understand are two different two different things that we always have to um, concern ourselves but but there there certainly is a drive uh, mr. Fetzko to what you've said is we want love to grow the communications department there's a lot of work to be done there um, we've got some talented people who could who could help but we just it's it's those positions with declining enrollment, we we lost over a thousand students to vouchers, the the family empowerment uh, scholarship vouchers. So, it just I, I just didn't feel right about adding a a, a position there. Okay, Patty. Um, if we're going to uh, postpone this position discussion, I would also ask that. Uh, we take a look at the minimum requirements. If it's a public relations position, um, and, and as you said just then, you can't, you have to, we know that the person in this position now can do everything that's on here. But if you're really trying to create a public relations assistance position, there needs to be, in my mind, a little more, um, skill set directed to public relations within this minimum requirements. Um, that was one of the reasons as well that I was reluctant to move to public relations because I, we've had a lot of discussions about what we envision that looking like. And, um, you know, so I understand what you're trying to do. You're trying to save us money by, you know, asking someone to do a little bit more work than um, they're already doing, which we do every day for everybody in this district. They put on a new hat, they do extra work. Um, but I just think before we, before we combine these two positions this way, and I, I, as I said, I'm sorry that I, um, I didn't bring up the other things that I had issues <laughs> with. I just well, I'm glad you brought this, this one up. One. <laughs> So do we need to amend the motion so that we are, because um, the original motion was to um, all accept all of it, yep. so. Yes. 
So do I have a motion to before you, Dr. Smith? You care if I? No, no, no. Please. Before you make a motion, I would like to add something to the conversation because I'm not sure which way you're going. You can do whatever you need to do with the first job description in G, but I would ask that you approve as much of the remaining document as you could because the timeline to be able to make transitions, whether it be title changes, people do retire, believe it or not, people quit, and we need to be able to have the time to fill those positions prior to getting to July 1. Um, so if there's other positions in here you wanna have conversations about, that is fine, but I would like for you to please entertain uh, approving the entire document minus whatever it is you have to continue to I, discuss. I think that's our plan, Keith. Okay, thank okay. you. All right, um, do I have a motion um, to approve G? Wait a minute, wait a minute. As a, I think we, we have a motion on the floor, right? Right. To, so we, to have amend. To, we have to we, get rid of it. We'll get amend, yeah. No, we have to no. amend before we vote on the motion. It has to be motion. a motion to amend. That's what I'm trying to do. And then a second. I want to get a motion to amend. Hmm? Or just yeah. We're, drop we're, one motion and get another motion. We just need a motion to amend, and then there needs to be a second. Or, or a, a motion to postpone the, the decision on the administrative recording secretary amended to public relations assistant until you our, you could certainly the, the, has, you, I, you would still have to handle that. We still have to parse that item out of this, the standing motion right now, which is to approve all four items. So the appropriate thing to do first would be- We're amending by t removing the, the um, following job description, the administrative recording secretary amended to public relations. We're removing that from the, that, my motion is to strike that position. Okay, did you, did you make the first who was it that that made the amendment? That's who has to make the change. No, no. That's what Any, you told anyone me I had to do the last time? No, no. It, it because mm -hmm. either way, you, okay. you you can't actually do it either way. If the original right. mover uh, uh, consents to the amendment, then it becomes your original motion. Hey, Holly, who is the original? Me. Oh, Mr. Slate. Okay, that's why I'm asking. All right. You consent to the amendment? Yes, I consent to the amendment to remove the professional administrative recording secretary to public relations assistant position from this item. Right. Then the motion as it stands is to approve the three. Right. In his amendment, does he have to state where it's going so it doesn't uh, you die? You can handle that as a separate um as a separate matter. You and I have different parliamentary procedures. That's my motion, my new motion. Does the person who seconded my motion agree with that? It was me. So the question <laughs> is, do you? Yes. So. Okay, so now we can go ahead and vote on. G. G. As amended. All right. If all minds are satisfied, let's vote on it. Does Holly have it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Mr. Fetzko? Mr. Fetzko? I'm, I'm still 50 50 with her. Okay. And then with the remaining. Motion carries item. 5 0. Thank you, Mr. Fetzko. And, and there can now be a motion to resolve the remaining item. Okay. Do we have a motion to resolve the remaining item? Are we talking about K? We're on K now, right? Mm -hmm. oh, uh, no, because oh, no. I wanted the, to know the recording right. secretary. Yeah, because uh, that's what I wanted. I wanted right. to make sure that we you, had you can. Done with we that. can either. Uh, we can either I would treat move it as that having. We, um, put the. I, I don't recording, know the administrative court recording secretary um, discussion. Uh, well, on the next me money meeting uh, in May. Frankly, you, I, I don't know that we need to take any further action on it. The board has not approved it, and so it can just come as a new recommendation uh, for discussion right. next month. New discussion month. on the right. Friday agenda. Okay. Yes, and, sir. And if it helps, there's th that. Th that isn't a pressing decision to make yeah. for that one. So whereas the others were, uh, what Mr. Leonard was speaking to, that those positions embedded in there were 
were needed That's to be decided upon. Thank you, sir. Okay, so now we're gonna be moving on to item 25K, and that's to approve the 2022-2023 Department Personnel Planning Depart document. Do it, I have a motion? I think. If I could yes. make a recommendation, the motion should be, if it is the board's will, to approve the, um, the PPD, it would be to approve the PPD with the exception yeah. right. of the job description right. for the administrative secretary slash public relations assistant. Thank you, Madam I, It might be easier if we just delete the addition of the public relations assistant because she, the administrative recording secretary is still. It's, if that's still on there, then that would be the appropriate way to handle that. Mr. D Mr. Leonard. I just want to make sure with Mrs. Odom, because I want to make sure we're not deleting a position. That's right. And That's in what K, I want to make sure. if it's your, if you would be okay, um, Dr. Smith, if we would just say that the administrative recording secretary will stay okay. as it has been in the 21-22 school year. Or get there. Ac academic That's year, it would stay that to. way. And then if we have a different direction that we want to go prior to getting to June, we would do so. But I want to make sure the position is available for the individual that sits in it. Right. Okay. 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 Well, and, and as I understand it, I, I did not look to see if the administrative recording secretary is still in the PPD. Is it, it in is, there now? It is here, but it is... Rem the position is not fillable. It is, it, it is, so that position is a zero for the next. Then I would suggest that the, um, the motion, the appropriate motion would be to approve the PPD with the accept, but reject the recommendation regarding the change to the administrative secretary and the addition of the um, administrative recording assistant. I, but if we reject that, then that, does that take that position away? No, no, because you because you are rejecting the deletion Here, of the yeah. administrative okay. recording All secretary. Right. Just making sure. So he'll be adding that back into the first change. Was that your motion? Uh, yes, I okay. made the, the it's All on right. page one of fifty. It's under the superintendent uh, general department. Have you, fin have you finished it? You yeah. finished the motion? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? If not, please vote. Yay. We're motion in. carries 5 0. Okay. Moving on. Next, we have the items from the superintendent. All right. The first uh, item is disciplinary reassignments. Mr. Superintendent, what is your recommendation? Yeah, for uh, item number 41, student discipline recommend approval for item A, disciplinary reassignments as noted on the board agenda with details provided in the board backup. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have second. Second. Any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Next is a formal hearing recommended order. Mr. T Superintendent, what is your recommendation? Yes, expulsions recommend approval for item B, formal hearing recommended order, as noted on the board agenda with details provided in the board backup. Mr. Chair, yes. if I might, the appropriate motion for this would be to approve the recommend, to adopt the recommended order of the hearing officer. All right, do we have a motion to approve the recommendations of the hearing, the order of the hearing officer, I guess? Recommended order. Recommended order. Do I have a motion? So move. Second. I'll second. <laughs> Thank you. Any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. All right, lastly, we have items from the internal auditing. Item A is an inventory adjustment report for nine cost centers. Is there a motion? Move the adoption of the property inventory report. Second. 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 Third. Fourth. 
If no discussion, please. I have a discussion. Oop. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just well, want, I know you guys are ready to leave, but we have to do the work of the district. I know. Um, I, I want to congratulate Inslee, Molino Park, O.J. Sims, and West Pensacola for no findings in the audit report. Mm -hmm. And thank you to the rest of the people who are doing diligent work keeping up with our, our stuff. Great job out there. It is. All right. All right, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, uh, for the good of the order, I do have an item I want to discuss briefly. Um, and I talked to our uh, board attorney. Uh, as, as Tim knows, we got out of the, the last meeting of the Board of Education in Naples, okay, because we thought it was kind of ridiculous to go down there when we didn't even have anything to report to fly to superintendent down there or drive the superintendent down there to discuss. So now they're inviting him to go to Key West. Okay. <laughs> well, now here's the deal. The superintendent still don't have nothing to report because of the time period that's coming up. We won't know the results. And so I was talking to the board attorney because this is a cost to the district to fly a superintendent down there, to have him a hotel, and I was there in Tallahassee where he got cut off by the chair and was told he only had three minutes, okay? I thought that was not in good taste by that board chairman, okay? So now we're gonna fly a superintendent down to um, Key West for three minutes. And I, I, I just don't know if you shouldn't send some type of email stating the cost of the district and asking if you can get a reprieve from going down to Key West. Because we were trying to think about what was dollars per second, that if he has to go down there and stand in front of the board, and I, do, you, do you think you would have anything to really tell him? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and where I'm going at is, is what Mr. Fesco told his constituents the other day when I heard it. They've had control of the school for five to six years. It's yeah. their program. They got DOE people in there every other day, don't they, Paul? Mm -hmm. Just about it. So you're going to go down there to give them a report on the job that they're doing, but we don't have the testing results yet. It, it, yes, in recent conversation with the DOE, also the, the recommended direction of that presentation would be um, the, the future uh, as opposed to the current. It, it's, 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 there's a lot of speculation Is it, involved in the, you know, just these conversations. So it's a lot of, to your point, there's not much concrete in it. Yeah. Would they allow you to, uh, I think Ms. Odom suggested it, to, to zoom in to the meeting? Uh, should they have that capability, Ms. Odom, to be able to zoom? I, I, or some type I of... I don't know. That's going to depend... Well, knows, that will largely depend on the facility where they're um, meeting. Is, is I, it appropriate to submit a written document? In, in light of me being there personally, can someone read this into the proceeding? Yeah. And just email it to somebody? <laughs> I, th I think the concern with that would be that the board may want to ask questions, and if you send something in writing, there is no, there's no way to get an immediate response. I, I think they expect to be able to ask questions. And, and I think the most cost-effective thing to do would be to request that he be permitted to, you know, due to the concerns on the taxpayers' dollars, mm -hmm. um, that, that would it be agreeable for them for him to appear by Zoom. Could you send that request? I absolutely that? can, yes, yes. And at least we've done our due diligence and uh, we can tell our taxpayers that uh, you know, the Board of Education can require you to fly to Key West for a three minute uh, session. I was able to work a reprieve for last month. You did, so we did good. We, we, we had one <laughs> They just moved the meeting far to the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From Naples to down there, yeah. Yes, so, but I will, I will, pursue that yes okay. my only concern is I don't like I'm not a great fan of this group anyway but um, I don't want the district or the superintendent to be thought of in a bad way for not coming 
And I, I, I don't, is there, is there someone you can, the chancellor, someone you can speak to and get an opinion? I, yes, yes. I can, I can reach out. Okay. And make that contact, yes. I mean, I, I just think it's important that even if you don't like the way they act, we act appropriately yes. for the sake of the superintendent and the district. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been canceled. We sent a van down there and we got five minutes, right, Ms. Odom? Yes. Yes, if that much. Had a lovely lunch. I guess <laughs> that was the, the best part of the trip. But, um, yeah. I mean, I, I just, the, the posture of that organization, and especially since we have two new members, is that right? At least, at least two. I believe there's two. two. Yes. Right, because two of them were dismissed. Resigned. They were dismissed. <laughs> They were re resigned they were, pending dismissal. They were resigning so they could not be, yes. So I, that's my only concern. Okay. I, I'm glad you brought that up, Bill, because I, I that is, it, it, unfortunately, the climate we are living in. Right. And um, where they um, do not take kindly to people who disagree with what they want them to do. So you do what you think is best. Okay. You know, um, I felt as chair, though, I had to bring it up so my fellow board members could well, understand what's getting ready to happen. When will we have a new commissioner? I uh, do not know. He's I actually know. still there. He, I know. His, the end of his term, though, is supposed to be at the, the end of this month. Oh, is it? Um, okay. Yes, that was the original statement. So, I mean, if we have a new one and you feel like it's important for you to be in front of this new one, to talk about us, we, we can certainly write the check. I don't, I don't have a problem with that because, you know, it's not a wonderful flight to Key West, but enjoy it. But uh, yeah, it would be breaking. good if we could save some taxpayer dollars. Well, I agree, but we have to break in a new commissioner. Yes, we need to take advantage of it. Yes, make it a good three minutes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay is there is there anything else for the good order i i do want to thank our employees that are still sitting out there i know it's been a long night for you and and uh, hopefully we won't have one, one this long again for a while yes patty i just wanted to say um thank you to the district and especially to those employees we had a we honored on friday all of the people that are retiring and I was glad to talk to many of them and said they, they just gonna stay out a year and they'll be back. So um, I, I wanted to get their name in writing at that point, but, uh, but again, thank you to, to Ms. Payne, Dr. Smith, for the, and, and Mr. Leonard and his whole department who worked hard on making that event very special. And, um, but uh, I wanna thank all of those who are leaving us and they're all so young and so, uh, we will miss you, and um, we hope you'll come back as volunteers. I think, All right. I think it's also important to remind, let's say, Thursday night, the teachers of the year are being honored at the Wahoos baseball game, which is a little more recognition than we've had in the past, so I think that's good. Yes, it should be a great event. I yes. think it's wonderful. And for the board's information, I will not be able to make that Saturday uh, arts thing with Matt Gates. Okay. I have a, another engagement. Yes, Paul. Right. The Military Affairs Committee met today, and one of the things that came out of that was uh, the Pensacola Police Department reported that there is a large uptick in uh, vehicle break ins. Hmm. And uh, the uh, chief asked that people go back to their respective. Um, departments or, or places of business and, and warn people that the best thing you could do is lock your cars, um, that they are not necessarily breaking glass to get in, but people are leaving their cars unlocked. But there has been a huge uptick um, in the number of car burglaries. So as you go home tonight, when you go in the house, lock your car. And it's surprising how many of them just, they just go by to lift the handle. 
That's they all they said do. that they, they've got from the, the uh, video cameras that people have at their houses, there's three to four who work in a group, one car, they get out, they drive, one person drives it, but the other three go down both sides of the street or the, side, or the uh, this, uh, driveways and just check the handles. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and unfortunately, people are still leaving firearms in unlocked vehicles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. please lock them. Anything else for the good of the order? You okay? Yes, indeed. You okay, Dr. Heller? Okay. All right. If we are adjourned. Oh.